Um, all right, great. Uh, and we are recording. So um, I think we are recording. Yes, we are. Okay, great. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome uh, to Think Tank 2021 Homecoming. Um, we're super excited to uh, have a, a really exciting group of speakers for you here today. Um, this is going to be the first of four Think Tank events happening this autumn, um, hosted here by Legged Architects. Um, this year, we're going to be focusing on uh, the theme of homecoming, which uh, Ross is going to explain to us in a minute here. Um, before I hand it over to Ross, I just want to um, acknowledge and thank all of our panelists who are coming to us from all over the world and the country. Um, we have uh, panelists from as far away as Berlin, um, panelists from Seattle, from uh, Madison, from Columbus, and I'm just so grateful to um, each of them for coming here and uh, volunteering to spend their uh, afternoons or in some cases their late nights with us here. Um, so to that end, uh, I want to go ahead and introduce the person who will be guiding this discussion this afternoon, um, Ross Jackson from Legged Architects' Columbus, uh, Ohio office. Um, Ross is uh, Ross joined Legged Architect in March of 2021. Um, he has worked on a bunch of educational projects, uh, including renovations and maintenance upgrades um, for different, uh, different schools. Um, when Columbus City Schools challenged Legget to design masonry repairs and flooring improvements, um, Ross not only finished the drawings early, but um, also came in under budget. So um, he's a great designer. He's been a great asset to us in helping to plan the think tank this year. Um, and most of the questions uh, that that cut, that are going to you know, that we're going to hear from later are, are actually from Ross. He he did most of this himself. So um, Ross earned his bachelor's and master's degrees in architecture at the Ohio State University, um, where he also served as a TA and taught undergrads how to use um, different architectural programs. So um, Ross, with that, I am going to hide myself here and turn it over to you. Thank you, Justin. Um, okay, well, thank you everyone for, for attending today. Um, let's uh, get started here. So um, why Think Tank? Uh, the Think Tank is an annual symposium orchestrated by Legged Architects. Each year, we invite authorities from a variety of disciplines to speak about trends related to their areas of expertise, as well as how design impacts those fields. Um, in recent years, um, the symposium has featured discussions about biophilic and sustainable design, health and, health and welfare, school safety, urban sprawl, and many other timely topics. This year, we are partnering with the Chicago Architecture Biennial and also AIA Chicago. Uh, today's conference will focus on reinvestment in our nation's learning infrastructure. What is homecoming? Homecoming is the act of bringing the disinvested back to the table with all the bittersweet realities that can entail. Reinvestment is the language of homecoming, not a physical return to a specific place, but a promise by investors to communities and users that they matter and that they are part of a legacy that will continue long after they're gone. Uh, I want to briefly acknowledge our partners and affiliates. Legged Architects has generally, uh, generously sponsored the Think Tank since its ince inception, and we wouldn't be here today without uh, their support. I also want to acknowledge the Chicago Architecture Biennial, now in its fourth iteration, and the second time the biennial has partnered with us for our think tank program. So today um, we will be hearing a keynote from uh, Jane Leach. Uh, she is the CEO at Future Ready Columbus. And following that, there will be a, um, a 15 minute break um, after which there will be a, a panel discussion um, featuring um, featuring uh, Marcel Robichon. Just a second here. Uh, featuring Marcel Robichon. Uh, uh, professor of Agriculture at Humboldt University of Berlin. David Webb, owner at the Well. Uh, Dr. Dr. Professor Suzanne Junker, Professor of Design at the University of Applied Sciences in Berlin, and Sarah Leida, PhD 
of a, a PhD, Senior Advisor at Playful Learning Landscapes Action Network. Um, and now to introduce our keynote speaker, Jane Leach. Jane is the CEO at Future Ready Columbus. She has four decades of experience in education as a teacher, school administrator, school administrator and preschool founder. Throughout her career, Jane has put human beings at the center of the work, setting the standard that people always come first, exemplified by a tireless dedication to improving the lives of children in Franklin County. Jane's commitment to excellent and equitable ed education has been revered and recognized by community members throughout her career. Among other recognitions, she was named Northwest Woman of the Year, honored by the Upper Arlington Rotary, and received the Community Involvement Award from Columbus City Schools. The Ohio State University recognized Jane early in her career with the Young Educator Award. While Jane earned her bachelor's and master's degrees from the Ohio State University, she maintains that life experience has been her greatest teacher. It is clear to her that education is so much more than reading, writing, and mathematics. Uh, thank you for joining us today, Jane. And if anyone has questions for Jane, uh, please ask them in the Q&A box, and we will read the question and who it is from uh, at the end of the presentation. Uh, so uh, take it away, Jane. Wonderful. Thank you for your kind introduction and for welcoming me to this virtual stage. In reviewing my 40 plus years as an educator, I truly didn't imagine that today as a CEO, I would be speaking with such a diverse group of professionals. And yet here I am with a compelling story to share. As a school administrator known as an urban turnaround specialist, I became all too familiar with disinvestment, disruption, and design as steps toward greater growth and change. By hosting this event, your organization recognizes that there's room for improvement when it comes to design. And yes, design begins with a problem. We had this revelation at Future Ready Columbus. Our recognized problem? The dismal kindergarten readiness gaps our county's children presented as measured by the state sanctioned kindergarten readiness assessment that measures upon kindergarten entry, each child across four developmental domains, social foundations, including social and emotional development, mathematics, language and literacy, physical well-being and motor development. We studied this data to find that only 40% of our children enter kindergarten ready to thrive along with even more disturbing data that revealed racial and economic disparities and their devastating impact on children. Now, why is kindergarten readiness such a big deal? Well, at Future Ready Columbus, also known as FRC, we knew based on research and our professional experiences that 90% of brain development occurs within the first five years of life. That's huge. More than just paving the way for children uh, to learn reading and mathematics skills, those early years are building neural pathways that help children learn how to navigate life, build relationships, and manage their emotions. Given that, you can begin to understand that how a child enters kindergarten greatly influences their life trajectory, both positively and negatively. When children enter kindergarten not ready, we see an increased rate of special education placement, grade repetition, high school dropout, teen pregnancies, arrests and time spent in the juvenile justice system, unemployment, arrests for violent crimes, time in jail. We also see lower levels of post high school education and lower earnings for those who become employed. To add insult to injury, not entering kindergarten ready implicates overall poor health outcomes. All of this from not being ready upon kindergarten entry. The data alone is compelling, but I've seen these impacts firsthand across my career, but in particular in my time as principal of Highland Elementary School. Highland is one of those schools with a large population of socioeconomically disadvantaged students and families. 
I was the fifth principal there in five years and not everyone before me stayed a full academic year. It was a tough place to work and an even tougher place to go to school. When I met my first group of children in that building, I recognized how enormous the gaps were in their preparedness for kindergarten. Some children were unable to state their last name. Some couldn't share where they lived or they were unable to recite their phone number because it changed as frequently as the minutes ran out on their mother's phone card. Too many children came to school day after day in soiled clothes. I watched talented children repeat grades and all too often get into trouble. Their lives before they'd ever gotten to school had really, really been hard and it had a direct impact on how they showed up each and every day to school. I truly, genuinely, and honestly loved these children. I saw the problems and the gaps in opportunity, and so I did whatever I could. I gathered volunteers from the local church down the road. I worked with the city of Columbus to have a neighboring vacant building torn down. I worked with community members to support the addition of a community garden the size of a city block. I kept track of the doctor's appointments, of some of my more troubled students and made sure they had transportation to get to their appointment. And I worked with the Ohio State University to have monthly visits via, via a large van so that my students received regular dental care. I installed a hand-me-down washer and dryer in the school building so that we could wash students' clothes and I made certain that we served a home cooked meal at every school event to encourage and ensure family engagement. For five years, I saw the challenges and for five years, I tried to do whatever I could. And I realized that my work alone would never be enough. The system was broken, not our school and the system needed a solution. Now we have data to illustrate the breadth of the problem. And despite the heavy flow of funding into wonderful programs designed to correct the myriad of social challenges our children and families are facing, the interventions as shown by that data were not and are not working. So let me first by, begin by applauding all of you. It takes courage to call out a problem, to be realistic, honest and tenacious in saying, Houston, we have a problem. In Central Ohio, Future Ready Columbus, an organization committed to collective impact through broad-based collaboration became the disruptor. This nonprofit organization was established, re-established just three years ago to disrupt the system and as a result, to arrest the decline in our community's disheartening kindergarten readiness results, to disrupt the status quo, to create a sense of hope for our children, to focus on young children prenatal to age five, to lead and guide the community into a new understanding that kindergarten readiness matters to children, families, and communities, and to change the very culture of our community. Now that could be overwhelming, but we chose to think of our problem as a challenge, an opportunity, and found that our mindset shift ignited a spirit of can do acceptance, excitement, and yes, anticipation. That does not mean we didn't face our share of roadblocks and hurdles. For one, we were up against history. There was a previous iteration of Future Ready Columbus that focused on children from cradle to career. Despite the best intentions, it folded. Perhaps the focus was too big a bite of the apple. Some in our community recalled this first attempt at change and wondered if Future Ready 2.0, even with our new narrowed prenatal to age five focus, would encounter the same fate. Also, Future Ready Columbus didn't have a leader. For over a year after, after the first CEO left, the organization was rudderless with a skeleton staff of three. By the time I came on board, the organization needed a reboot for its people, and its mission. Our new systems focus approach was chided for being an effort to boil the ocean. Some thought we were aiming too high with our 100% goal. 
Others worried that the system-based approach would be too complex. After all, isn't early childhood really early early childhood learning really only about the learning? They would ask. And my answer was no. 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 We can't look at fixing individual programs. We have to fix the system as a whole. We have to strive for collective impact. Some worried we didn't have the manpower to accomplish what we set out to do. While we do indeed have a small team, we are also able to leverage the power of collective impact. We're working with a robust number of strategy leaders across the region who believe in the work and are helping design and build solutions to reach every member of our community. More days than not, being a disruptor is an uphill journey. You're blazing a new trail and change as we all know can be hard. To get through these challenges, our foundational practice and personal belief has been to put the children at the center of every decision we make, every action we take. If it doesn't make sense for our children, we've strayed from our focus and our calling. During my very first Future Ready Columbus board meeting, I gave each board member a picture of a child in this prenatal to age five group. And I encouraged them to tuck the picture in their portfolio, to put it on their bathroom mirror, to keep it on their car dashboards. Whatever they did with those photos, I wanted our board members to be able to look at the eyes of those children and remember they are who we are doing this work for. I knew it had made an impact when I went to visit a board member in his office and hanging on his office wall, I saw that he had framed the photo I'd given him. That's powerful. He embraced the disruption and had invited the disruption into his whole world. Yes, disruption is hard. Disruption is the road less traveled, but remember why you're doing it and keep going. Our solution developed differently. It's normal for individuals and entities to rush to the solution by embracing more programs, spend more money, get more programs. However, as a collective impact organization, we address the creation of the solution by taking a systems building approach. We stated again and again and again, that there's simply not enough money in the universe to buy enough programs to be the solution we all long for and much needed. Look out your window to determine if the programmatic approach is working. What do you see? Whether looking to the left or the right, do you see disheartening evidence that all is not well? Think of it like making a commitment to getting in shape. I'm guessing we've all been there one time or another, and we promise ourselves we're going to work out more often to achieve our goals. By logging, but logging more time in the gym alone isn't going to cut it. We need to look at what we're eating, how much we sleep, our medical conditions, how's our level of stress, how are we managing our time? Making one change, working out more, isn't a bad thing. It just isn't enough to get you to your ultimate goal. So let's quickly review the basic tenets of a collective impact as detailed by the Stanford Social Innovation Review. Number one, you have to have a common agenda. A collective impact approach requires all participants to have a shared vision for change. One that includes a common understanding of the problem and a joint approach to solving it. For Future Ready Columbus, that's our Early Childhood Advisory Council, the group of leaders from organizations and agencies across Franklin County who are committed to this work and who play a role in it. Number two, shared measurement systems. A collective impact approach collects data and measures results consistently on a short list of indicators at the community level and across all participating organizations to ensure that all efforts remain aligned and accountable to each other. At Future Ready Columbus, we're maintaining our commitment to data and measuring our impact in two key ways. We've recently hired a full-time director of data, IT, and performance. And let me tell you, she is a powerhouse. 
We've also created our Data Oversight Council, where we review, discuss, and analyze key performance indicators for our work. Why do we need these measures? Because it's not just about the work. It's about doing the right work that gets us closer to our 100% goal. It's about the impact. The third tenant of a collective impact is mutually reinforcing activities. Collective impact initiatives depend on a diverse group of stakeholders working together, encouraging participants to undertake the specific set of activities they excel at in a way that supports and is coordinated with the actions of others. For Future Ready Columbus, this is our Future Ready by Five plan. It collects all of the initiatives into one comprehensive document, and it shows how our strategy leaders work together. A fourth tenant of collective impact is continuous communication. A collective impact approach develops trust among nonprofits, corporations, and government agencies. And yes, it is a monumental challenge. Time is needed to recognize and appreciate the common motivation behind each other's efforts and to see that their own interests will be treated fairly and that decisions will be made on the basis of objective evidence and the best solution to the problem. For Future Ready Columbus, we have recently hired a full-time director of communications, another powerhouse on our team and in our community. She will have an inward and an outward focus to her job, working to connect with those in the community, as well as with our internal strategy leaders to encourage alignment across the board. And finally, backbone organizations. In the best of circumstances, backbone organizations embody the principles of adaptive leadership. You have to have the ability to focus people's attention and create a sense of urgency. The skill to apply pressure to stakeholders without overwhelming them. The competence to frame issues in a way that presents opportunities as well as difficulties and the strength to mediate conflict among the stakeholders. With each of our strategy leaders at Future Ready Columbus, we have an agreement in place, a charter. We're laying out all our expectations between us so they're clear. Another hallmark of our backbone organization is our implementation office led by our director of implementation and a project manager. It's their job to hold all strategy leaders accountable for what they say they're going to do and to be there to support them no matter what they need. Moving forward, we didn't apply assumptions to our work. During the cold winter days of COVID, we reviewed the work of learning advocates, early learning advocates across the country at the local, state, and national think tank levels. We noticed the barriers children face and the results different attempts taken to tackle these barriers. We noticed a common thread among the one kindergarten readiness effort that worked. They looked at the system rather than analyzing early learning in isolation, rather than taking the easier road, the programmatic approach. Sound familiar? Additionally, we recognize that much more must go into the process of ensuring our children can succeed in life than education initiatives alone. So we chose to look at the system as a whole to attempt to address everything that impacts a child's ability to thrive. Remember I mentioned we were chided for trying to boil the ocean? Yet my experience as a school administrator solidified my understanding that housing, Food, healthcare, behavioral health, safety, and family engagement must all be factored into the success of our children. When I left Highland Elementary after five years, I did so because I wanted to pursue another dream, one that took shape after my experience there and seeing the challenge our children and families faced. I realized that what happens before our children go to school is critically important. And when I went in search of learning opportunities on that side of town for our children to receive quality opportunities to grow early in their lives, there was just one, one. So I chose to start a high quality preschool just five blocks from the school. 
and it filled with the younger siblings of my former students. It became a school of excellence. I saw how hungry our community was for opportunities for quality early learning. And my experience starting this preschool in that same neighborhood showed me again the power of looking at a problem holistically. That experience influenced our design as well and is part of what informs our work at Future Ready Columbus. We know there's a need and we know that the system is broken and we're working as hard as we possibly can to fix it. Following this boiling the ocean approach, we formed a 39 member early childhood advisory, an early child advisory council comprised of diverse community stakeholders. And we called on them to inform the kindergarten readiness solution. In fact, this council co-authored the kindergarten solution. We talked and learned well from folks in transportation, because we know that a parent's ability to get to and from work and access childcare facilities is a driving force in the early learning conversation. Joanna Pinkerton, CEO of the Central Ohio Transit Authority called me one evening to confess that the book we had given to each early childhood advisory council member, The Deepest Well by Dr. Nadine Burke Harris about ACEs, which are adverse childhood experiences, it was on her nightstand and it was keeping her awake. Thus, she called me. It opened her eyes to the fact that transportation impacts a child's kindergarten readiness. Her story became one of many in the course of understanding and action from a diverse group, holistically not connected to children in kindergarten or entering kindergarten. We learned well from childcare providers because we know that their training and development is critical to the process of evolving early learning. In our quest to address the trauma all too often experienced by our young children at such a pivotal time in their brain development, we joined with partners and offered conscious discipline training an evidence-based trauma-informed approach recognized as one of the nation's top social emotional learning approaches that provides an array of behavior management strategies and classroom structures that childcare professionals can use to turn everyday situations into learning opportunities. Without exception, the training feedback we received was overwhelmingly positive. We learned well from executives because they focus on the future talent pool in the region and have a vested interest in seeing our children thrive. Kenny McDonald, president and CEO of One Columbus, an organization that is consistently named among the best development organizations in the country, connected healthy kindergarten entry with the healthy, vibrant workforce of the future. We learned from elected officials because they represent the people in our communities and they are our partners in the work. Our mayor stated in his city, State of the City address, quote, Children develop, children develop most in the first three years of life, everything from motor skills and language to the ability to socialize. Those without stable housing, food, and a nurturing environment will face developmental barriers that last a lifetime, unquote. And we focused on our community members at large, parents, grandparents, aunties, and early learning volunteers from all socioeconomic levels and even each other, because every demographic has distinct challenges. As a white woman, I was sometimes held in suspicion, fearing that I was another do-gooder dropping in to save the day and make myself good, feel good and then vanish. However, when the word spread that my passion for children and people, justice and equity had been evidenced for over 40 years, the suspicions largely evaporated. I have lived, worked, played, and worshiped in Columbus, Ohio for over 63 years. My father was a school superintendent, school superintendent of the Columbus City Schools at the time of school desegregation. I grew up seeing the challenges of our system take shape. I grew up with someone who was tenacious about finding a solution about keeping and about keeping the focus on children. And then I followed in his footsteps. 
I'll never truly know what it's like to walk in someone else's shoes, but I have walked alongside many of them all my life. And I believe that counts for a lot. Thankfully and amazingly, others have too. There's always seemed to be at least one person in most audiences who vouched for my genuineness, sincerity, and tenacity in this work. So be mindful of the footprint you establish each day. It can become a game changer. Of similar importance and being mindful of our Future Ready Columbus footprint and the FRC, FRC team, I embrace the importance of growing, um, excuse me, being aware of our um, footprint as Future Ready Columbus, the FRC team and I embrace the importance of growing in our personal and our corporate responsibility to become more culturally and racially competent. We regularly read common texts, difficult texts, texts and engage in thoughtful and sometimes raw discussions. We're vulnerable with one another so that we may develop and mature you'll find some of the books in the biblica, bibliography that I provided. But finally, we spent more than six months intentionally collecting community insight by conducting focus groups, distributing digital questionnaires and appearing before organizations across the Franklin County region. We asked questions and we made it clear that we didn't know all the answers and that we needed community members to offer valuable insight so that the kindergarten readiness plan would have key impacts and not be a plan that would gather dust on a shelf with zero real world impact. All told, we connected with close to 2000 people during the global pandemic. And that's not to say it was easy. This work requires tenacity, not just my own, but from the entire team. And it's just impossible to predict every challenge that will come your way. For instance, we were so committed to making sure we listened across the community that we often had language barriers. We had to work through those challenges, not only on Zoom, but physically. When it was early in the days of the COVID-19 pandemic, we would hold focus groups in sanctuaries, in masks, spaced six feet or more apart, and trying to understand someone who spoke limited English. So it wasn't just the language barriers. You miss so much without the ability to read facial expressions and social cues. Our team had to learn fast and to find another way. We also communicated with the deaf community and had someone signing for us so we wouldn't exclude that vital part of our population. Some businesses allowed us to do these focus groups and insight sessions on work time or lunch hours, but not all. Still, we were committed. If someone wanted to talk to us at six in the morning, the answer was, sure, yes. If they couldn't eat until nine, the answer was, yes. We moved heaven and earth to make sure we were accommodating to those precious people we needed to hear from. Sometimes we'd take in food so we could be sure uh, people wouldn't miss a meal to take part in our conversations. The days were long and the work was intense, but we quite simply would not be where we are today without that effort. We wouldn't have the plan that represents our community and we wouldn't be poised for impact. We gathered all these insights chronicled from six months of conversations, analyzed them and used them as the foundation for the kindergarten readiness solution. For Future Ready Columbus, the disruptor, the physical manifestation of the solution is aptly named Future Ready by Five. We're now moving forward as we speak, knowing this work will have significant impact because it addresses the needs, concerns, and challenges of those all across our community. July was a huge month for continuing the energy because Future Ready by Five received unanimous approval by our Early Childhood Advisory Council and our Board of Directors. To understand the enormity of this unanimous yes, you must understand that these women and men are not automatic yes people. They're bold, critical thinkers, and it's their job to challenge us, to make us work toward the best absolute version of the plan for our community. And they did in the months leading up to this vote. 
And now they have said yes. Yes to Future Ready by Five implementation. Yes to systemic change. And yes to every child, family in this community. So let's take a quick look at Future Ready by Five. On the left-hand side, you obviously see the goal of 100% kindergarten readiness. And we're focusing on four drivers to get us toward that goal, including families and communities, education and development support, education and development supports, health and behavioral health, and a public and private infrastructure. Supporting those drivers are sub goals and strategies that are led by strategy leaders across our community. And the outcome that we're shooting for in our first three year plan toward this uh, larger plan to get us to 2030, we will have, it's our outcome to have an, out, an equitable, aligned prenatal to age five system that ensures every child is ready for kindergarten, that they have the supports they need, that our families and community members are engaged and active and focused on kindergarten readiness, that we will continue to move as a community from trauma to resilience, and that any approaches we use will be steeped with anti-racism uh, philosophies and practices and beliefs so that we can create equity for our children and the people who touch a child's life. So what's next for Future Ready by Five? Well, the strategy leaders are, are gathering experts and resources to support their initiatives and accomplish their goals as detailed in Future Ready by Five. The charters are being established, so the expectations among strategy leaders and Future Ready are clear. These charters also create safeguards to ensure that the goals embrace anti-racism approaches while also measuring impact. Our plan is to approach our goal in three-year phases. Right now, we're in phase one, but before we know it, phase two will be upon us. In the not too distant future, we'll begin working on the next three-year phase of Future Ready by Five. I believe you can see that it takes courage and bravery to stand up in the middle of the universe and loudly proclaim, we have a problem. Let's name it, let's claim it. I hope you have seen through my unfolding story that the secret to success in the world of disruption is a systems building approach. You don't have to be the expert and you don't have to go it alone. In fact, it's really best not to. It takes us, the we, to design. In kindergarten readiness, if kindergarten readiness were easy, my friends, it would have been tackled long ago. A lot of books would have been written and talk show host appearances would be the norm. Further, we wouldn't be filled with dismay and discouragement when looking out the, at the world outside our window. Great design, great results and great investments require learning about and investing in the communities you serve to understand, really understand the needs, wants, and what will allow individuals and communities to make better use of available assets. Great design, great results, and great investments also require unrivaled compassion and commitment. It seems that I think about this work mm, about 25 hours a day and seven days a week. As the CEO, I lead board members, our team, and our partners along this path. And it's a really big deal because of the children, their families, and our communities. The weight of this can become onerous at times. And as leaders, we must prioritize self-care to ensure we bring our best selves to our work each and every day. I implore you, when a new opportunity comes your way, press pause. Just as we took time to listen well and involve many, many others in solving a complex problem, you can do likewise. To view your assignment as an opportunity to proceed differently. We included the voices of parents, teachers, children, administrators, sanitation workers, social workers. The list goes on and on and on. Will you have the courage to call out the problem Will you step in the middle of the fray and lead the disruption? Do you want to be known as a disruptor? And if so, how will the course of action you pursue be influenced? How will it change? 
what course of action will you take after learning more about disinvestment, disruption, and design? I close with this final thought. Pour the concrete right using the systems-driven design in the first place. Involve others. When the pour is fresh, adjustments and adaptations can be readily made. However, if you don't pour the concrete right in the first place, by using a programmatic solution, fixing it requires a jackhammer. Now that's loud, it's messy, it's labor intensive, and let's face it, it's expensive. If the work in, of disinvestment, disruption, and design were easy, it would already be done well. So take time, involve others, listen well, be brave pour your concrete right in the first place. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jane. Um, we will now have our audience Q&A session. Um, if you have any questions for Jane, uh, put them down in the QA box below. Uh, our first question is from Adam Quigley. Uh, can you talk more about the coalition involved in starting uh, Future Ready Columbus? How did you assemble or find a team of individuals to start this organization? And how did you locate funding and financial support for your effort? Well, um, I, in I inherited the 501c3. I, I inherited the, uh, the name of the organization. And um, since I've lived in Columbus and worked my whole life here, I have a great network. And I often say, it's really expensive to be my friend because I will pull you into something pretty exciting and generally pretty big and transformative. Um, so um, I use my network and I met people and met people and met people. To be quite honest with you, the first year uh, as CEO of Future Ready Columbus, I went out into the community and I met with many, many people and um, listened well. And as I learned, you know, in these conversations over coffee or a walk or lunch, I began taking notes and then sharing the dream. And uh, folks were, are inspired by this work and readily said yes. So I'm, I'm grateful. That's what that, that and just our relationships out in the community have certainly propelled this work forward. Funding, that was another question, right? Um, it, we're a private public partnership. So we receive public funding and then we write grants and um, look for opportunities to bring in the money to make the, make the work happen. I think all of those in the nonprofit world are well acquainted with how you bring in the money. You work hard, <laughs> tell your story. <laughs> Great. Um, question from Nick Woodard. What is the role of nature or biophilic design in early childhood development? Have you noticed a difference in measurable results between students with access to nature and natural views versus those uh, who do not? Well, I can tell you just walking in a childcare center or in a school where there are big windows and natural light and trees and grass and flowers and the changing seasons, yes. And I, I guess I'm a really big fan of the natural light because we know that the fluorescent light really has negative impacts on children. Um, I know I have read studies around the world. There are schools where children don't even go into a building, right? They're outside all the time in all kinds of weather. And those children do exceptionally well in the world. So um, I would say, yes, there's, I have anecdotally seen that but the research supports uh, children being in nature. And I see Sarah shaking her head, yes, that she would agree with that as well. Um, question from uh, Justin Banda. Do you feel children are inherently more resilient than adults? Uh, how can we bolster early learners' resilience while still providing for their basic needs? Mm, are children more resilient than adults? Not sure I have an answer for that. Um, I know that children, I, I think as human beings, let's just go to that. We're resilient, we're survivors. And um, certainly the older we get, we develop more skills, I hope, in uh, coping with the pressures and the challenges of the world. I think in terms of young children, if they are, if we look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, if they're safe, they're loved, they're fed, uh, you know what? 
they do remarkably well as they go up that pyramid um, of social needs. So I, I just think that's the best foundation we can give our children. Um, Justin has a, another question. Uh, can you talk more about the role designers can play in supporting private ELC programs that focus on underprivileged communities? And what can architects do to support their communities that educators can't do alone? Mm. Well, the partnerships, certainly I have, uh, <laughs> I have said the value of folks coming together. So there's that and not, and I would encourage all of us to not be limited by the obvious connections. Um, clearly, you know, you saw how we formed the future ready by five plan and transportation and all these other very various, uh, community partners that you don't typically right off the top of your head think you should talk to about early learning. So that would be my first first say, first um, point. Look outside, get outside the box. Um, and then I would really actually weave that into the question about nature. Um, too often our children, especially those that Justin referenced in the question in urban areas, they don't have the opportunity to go out and play, just run around the neighborhood because all too often it's not safe. And so providing an opportunity within a, um, the safety of an early learning environment, that would be great. Whether it's courtyards with, you know, within the building, um, that is wonderful. And incorporating climbing, you know, children have to move, they have to play, they engage with their environment. And so to not just put um, a few structures in place, but really understand, and I think we're gonna hear more about this in our panel discussion, um, all that the, there's a lot of thought that needs to go into designing play structures for children, um, not just going through a catalog and picking out a few things that look like they're kind of fun. And so we'll, we'll look forward to our experts to weigh in on that, but um, provide safety for outdoor play within environments and uh, thinking outside the box in terms of incorporating others into your solutions driven. And to understand actually the, the, the work that happens every day it's really hard. Some people don't understand that you really have to be a professional in working with young children. I mean, they're just little, right? Don't you just play? Yes, you play, but there's intentionality behind the words you use, the environment that you set up, the interactions that you have, the assessments that you're constantly making on children. So I would really encourage um, architects and designers to get in the minds of what a, what a day really, really, really looks like and then uh, design accordingly. Um, uh, next question from Robin Randall. Uh, she thinks you're a role model for disruption, by the way. <laughs> I uh, guess I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what coaching can you give our team to, en to engage with uh, people like you? Hmm. I think Wilder finds its own level, to be quite honest with you. I'm drawn to people that um, think creatively and differently. Certainly social media has given us great uh, great opportunities to connect with disruptors, not just in our community, but around the world. And I'm looking forward to meeting more disruptors today, to be quite honest with you. And I expect my, the people that I follow on LinkedIn and Twitter and Instagram to go up because I want to meet these folks and on those that, you know, are on the call and uh, follow, follow the lead there too. Read a lot, listen a lot, scroll a lot. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> um, Adam Quigley asking, uh, for students who missed the uh, critical early learning window, what remedial methods can you recommend for bringing these students back up to speed? Well, I'm not sure the intention of that question because back up to speed academically or back up to speed socially, emotionally. So um, I'll take both. I, it's never too late, never, ever, ever too late to invest in the life of a human being. Mm -hmm. no matter their age. So, you know, those things that I mentioned were so important at early ages when those neural connections are being built. Well, it's never too late to um, let, help someone know that they're safe, they're fed, they're loved, correct? So, um, you know, putting other people's interests before your own would be a good start, being kind and recognizing that we all, we can't make assumptions on how someone's day is going. They could be having the most horrific day of their life and perhaps just a kind word instead of lashing out would be a great, you know, great response. Um, in terms of academically, the interesting thing is you can't 
just force children to learn. Um, there, it's an organic process. And so the conditions have to be right. You know, we just mentioned the lighting, the environment, the structures that children sit on, the flooring, um, how, they're, how they're encouraged to move because movement, you want children to cross the midline with their brain. There's lots that goes on. Um, and so pro providing the right environment for that increased opportunities to learn but to skill and drill kind of things, I'm not a fan of that. You might pick that up um, because it's a surface level learning and we want the unlearning embedded in the child's soul, to be quite honest with you. That's learning. Um, a question from our, our CEO, CEO Patrick uh, Brosnan. Can you share a story a, uh, or can you share a story of impact to a specific child or family? Mm, like from my personal experience? Yes. Yeah. I have some that have turned out great and some that have not, to be quite honest with you. And I think the thing that um, shocks me is the, um, I think you just have to be true to who you are and what you believe and be authentic. Um, and I, I think you'd see I'm a, I'm a people person. I really um, am energetic and care deeply about the success of of children. And I do believe that when we help instill success in children, it, 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 it instills in their, it spills into their families and then families create communities. So that's why I'm a real big fan of starting with children. Um, you know, I've had children that have gone on. If you want to talk about from the world's point of view, they're lawyers now. I mean, I, I am older than dirt, as I say. And so they're grown and their children's children, you know, are in the schools where I've been really humbling when you run into adults and they say, this was my principal when I was five. Great. Um, but uh, in terms of just well-rounded individuals, like thoughtful, kind individuals, uh, on the spot, I'm not thinking of a case, but I, there are, they exist, I can tell you. Mm -hmm. uh, very influential. I'm thinking of a staff member actually where um, really being an educator was not her thing. And I coached her out of the profession. And um, I thought it was the right thing to do for children, to be quite honest with you. And I, I ran into her decades later and she thanked me for saving her life. And I really, I said, how did I do that? Like, I have no memory of that. And it was the coach, it was a hard, hard conversation, right? Saying you need to look at a different career. And yet that changed the trajectory of her life. And she said, saved it. So it happens. Um, uh, Adam Quigley uh, asking, we often find the uh, public and private sectors are diametrically opposed. Jane, you talked about uh, centering students and making decisions based on whether they directly affect students. And this is a tactic that can often be in opposition to a private organization's financial concerns. What is the role of public-private partnerships when considering how to bring students up to par? Um, first blush, I will tell you, investing in the lives of young children and um, having them grow up in a healthy way changes, as I said, families and communities. There's a boatload of research um, that says there are uh, states that use that third grade reading assessment um, and they do use that correlation to how many prisons they're going to need down the road. So, um, draw that correlation for some businesses, for some private organizations, and that, mm, you know, that speaks. Quite frankly, investing in the lives of young children is workforce development. As Kenny McDonald noted, when we have healthy children growing up into healthy adults, that's a healthier workforce, and healthier workforce makes for a healthier economy, right? So you see the trajectory, and again, it's, it's sometimes I think that it's the private corporations just actually don't know of the correlation between investing in the lives of children. So it's our job that know that to be true, to, to say that. And so, you know, as I just said earlier, that when we were talking about the Future Ready by Five plan and, and receiving public insights, if someone wanted to meet early in the morning, the answer was yes. If they wanted to meet late at night, the answer is yes. It's the same thing. Um, you need to get like one or two people on, and I happen to have a wonderful board that believe and know that what we're saying to be true 
And then it's that ripple effect. And then they use their belief and their knowledge and their understanding of this solution. And they tell their, their network and help bring them along. And then they tell their network and they were like, and then, and that's what's happening in Franklin County in Columbus, Ohio. We have this momentum, this movement. And so keep an eye on us because um, great things are happening. It's no arm twisting. It's logical when you think about it, it's logical. You just have to help people understand the logic. Tell them the story. Uh, Ted Hauck, uh, what do you do as an organization to ensure the continued success of the student after they leave your program? Well, um, the United Way of Central Ohio have taken the next uh, group of, uh, of children. So they're focusing on kindergartens through grade three. And so that CEO and I meet monthly and talk about the strategies and what we're doing and what the data is showing us. And then uh, she can take that into her work and it influences her work. We also, um, we have an early uh, educational service center. And so we make sure that that superintendent is aware of what's going on at Future Ready uh, Columbus with the Future Ready by Five plan. And then he can share that information with all the uh, superintendents in the Franklin County area. I should say too, though, we also meet with the early learning uh, directors in the, in the neighboring school districts or in the school districts in Franklin County. Mm -hmm. And guess what? They're really excited about Future Ready by Five because they get it because it's true and it makes sense and it's logical and it's systems based and it's, it's organically um, arisen from our community. And so there's, there are great fans in that, in that arena as well. Um, our uh, last question. Uh, from Adam Quigley. Uh, there are often multiple entities involved when creating educational structures for students. Uh, when dealing with such polycentric oversight, how does oversight and decision making work? Uh, what does Future Ready Columbus do differently to succeed? Uh, well, first we, we call, let me, I'll just quickly review our process. I mean, we worked, we we called this Early Childhood Advisory Council together, 39 members from a, a diverse cross-section of the community because it couldn't be Jane Leach's plan. It couldn't be Future Ready Columbus's plan. It really, and when I say the we, it had to be our plan. We needed to create it. And so, you know, trying to get consensus with a group of 400 in a school gym isn't gonna work. But um, we started with those 39. We've read research. We talked about um, the connections in our worlds, studied, studied abstracts, and then we wrote a draft of we, the 39 member team, right? It was a lot of, for those of you educators on the line, but that whole writing process of drafting and revising, drafting and revising, drafting and revising, we did that a lot. Mm -hmm. And then could take, and then we took that plan out into the community to say, a diverse group of people within Franklin County wrote this. Now it's time for your voice to be included. And that's when we took those six months. And then we, we were transparent all the way at the, um, we, we redlined the original document to say what went away, what was consolidated, what new things were added and took that back out into community and say, we really did listen. We really did listen. Your voice really matters. And um, from that, we built the consensus. So that's, that's what worked for us. Okay. Thanks for the questions. Yeah. Uh, thank you for uh, taking them. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, we will now be taking a, a 30 minute ne networking intermission. Uh, I will be posting a Zoom link. Uh, oh, has Justin already put it back in there? Um, well, in this breakout room, uh, you can socialize with each other. Uh, and when we resume, we'll be moving our onto our panel discussion, which will take place on this on this same Zoom call. Uh, so, uh, don't delete the the email that you got for the Zoom. <laughs> and uh, we'll see you then. Yeah, guys, you can hang out here if you want. Um, you can um, join the the um, networking room. That's uh, you can all talk to each other. You can um, turn your cameras on, chat, whatever. Um, I will stay here to maintain this room. Um, when uh, Ross gives you the signal, um, just feel free to jump out and come right back in here. So um, there is a link here and there will be a link in the other room to get back in here. So um, don't feel like you're gonna lose anything. So Jane, thank you so much. Um, and everybody else, we'll see you back here at 3.30 in uh, just under 30 minutes. Thanks.
Okay. Well, um, let's see here. I think we're good to go. Um, I think we'll, uh, Ross, if you want to like get started here, what we can do is if you want to start the introductions to people, we can get rolling. And then um, as we progress, um, hopefully more people will filter through. Um, I don't have, uh, well, we don't have slides for the panel discussion per se. We just have what, what each of you sent us. So um, if you at any point want to reference um, a specific slide, um, Suzanne, Marcel, or Sarah, um, just let me know and I'll, I'll do my best to try to flip to that as we go. Um, and uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's get rolling here. So the first thing I want to do is um, share my screen. All right. Ross, if you want to take it away with the learning objectives and then introduce sure. our panelists. Okay. Well, uh, welcome back to the Think Tank. Uh, thanks again to Jane Leach for her uh, presentation. That was excellent, very informative. And uh, yeah, we'll get the, uh, the panel portion of the event started here. Um, our first uh, panelist is Sarah Lytle, PhD. She is the executive director of the Playful Learning Landscapes Action Network, uh, PLLAN. Uh, PLLAN fosters the creation of playful learning infrastructure and activities um, in the everyday spaces where children and families gather. By infusing our cities with playful learning opportunities, PLLAN seeks to improve educational equity and enhance children's cognitive and social development, better prefer preparing them for success in the 21st century. Sarah comes to PLLAN after a decade, decade at the University of Washington's Institute for Learning and Brain Sciences, where she was most recently the Director of Outreach and Education. Sarah is an expert in child development and has conducted research on language development and children's interactions with screen media. She has more than a decade of experience in connecting science to practice, working extensively with parents, early learning providers, and policymakers to, produce, uh, to promote evidence-based interactions with children. Sarah has a BA in psychology and Spanish from the University of Notre Dame and a PhD in developmental psychology from Temple University. Uh, welcome and thank you for being here. Uh, Dr. Oh, sorry. Uh, Dr. Suzanne Junker is a professor of architecture, interior design and virtual media, media at uh, Booth Hoch School. <laughs> Uh, uh, the University of Applied Sciences. So it, it's just sorry to interrupt you. It's it's Boyd, but it's a difficult oh. German name, so don't worry. <laughs> sorry. It's, <all. laughs> it's fine. And the Jaden one. What was that? Boyd. Okay. <laughs> uh, she completed her PhD on Bauhaus photographer Walter uh, Walter Peter Hans at the University of Fine Arts Fine Arts Hamburg, with extended research at IIT Chicago. She graduated from Technical University Berlin at, and taught at TFH Berlin since 1994. From 1992 to 1995, she worked with Professor, uh, Professor Joseph Paul Kleihaus uh, on the Hamburg Bahnhof Museum. She publishes uh, regularly on Baunatz.de uh, and other architectural platforms. Her photographic work has been awarded uh, numerous international prizes and together with Marcel Robichon, she leads the teaching and research project, Agritecture, which combines agrar ecology and architecture. Thank you, Dr. Junker. Uh, Dr. Marcel Robichon is a full professor for architect agricultural ecology at Humboldt University of Berlin since 2020. He graduated in forest sciences from the universities of Freiburg and Oxford, completed his PhD in plant biology at the University of Cambridge, and uh, worked as a postdoctoral researcher at the USDA FS Institute of Forest Genetics in California. He taught both plant sciences and education in agricultural sciences. His research interests include tree developmental biology, conservation, and world natural heritage. In the field of teaching and education, he holds a special interest in place and object-based learning and teaching. 
Together with Suzanne Junkert, he leads the teaching and research project Agritecture. Um, thank you, Marcel. And uh, our, our last panelist is uh, David Webb. Uh, he is the owner and founder of The Well, Preschool and Child Care. Uh, he recently launched a nonprofit, Global Playground Incorporated. There have been many discussions around education throughout the years, but only recently after having children and starting a business that would benefit them did David and his wife focus on play as a priority in education. Learning through play is at the heart of curriculum at the well, bringing joy and educational experiences to life through smiles and laughter is their focus. During the summer of 2020, David and his uh, wife slash business partner, uh, Angie, were heartbroken as the re realities of some of our country's largest uh, faults were highlighted, protested, and discussed. In order to play their small, uh, their small role in driving change, they started a nonprofit focused on playgrounds in under-resourced under communities. Global Playground Incorporated strives to offer those same moments of joy and educational play to children from all backgrounds. As they look to support children and their lifelong learning, they think the place to start is the local playground. Without a safe space close to your house to play, they think an, up an uphill battle begins. David received his bachelor's degree from uh, University of Wisconsin, Eau Claire. Uh, thank you, David. Thanks for having me. Uh, and of course, welcome back, Jane Leach. Um, if anyone has questions for the panel, uh, please ask them in the Q&A box, and uh, we will get to those toward the end of the discussion. Uh, all right. So, um, David, I, told, I said that all these questions are going to be for you, so I'll start with the first one. Um, with this year's Think Tank, Think Tank theme of reinvestment. I want to ask you to provide an example or a case study of disinvestment, an intentional, accidental, and or, and or systemic underserving of a community in your specific field. Uh, what are some of the challenges that you, you and your, uh, the other panelists have faced? Um, yeah. Great. Well, I'll look at this from two different perspectives. Then I have uh, the preschool um, that I have a few thoughts on and, and how uh, preschools are impacted in our community as well as parks. And I think um, Jane, who uh, was so insightful and had um, some incredible uh, things to offer, I'm, I'm going to, to cite a couple things that she had said that I took notes on it and try to link some of this together. So one thing that really made sense to me was when she said that side of the city. And I think a lot of this comes down to that side of the city. And all of us in our cities have that space and we're all working to improve it and to think about how it became such and, and what we're going to do about it. So when it comes to daycares, I, I again was thoroughly impressed that Jane was able to uh, open her daycare on that side of the city. So I opened uh, my daycare on uh, the other side of the city, the wealthier side of the city uh, as a business decision to you know, maximize uh, our investment and to uh, try to offer uh, the space that we had wanted. And we faced uh, a flood from when the janitor had left uh, the water on. We had a, a car crash into our building and a pandemic in our first three years of business. Mm -hmm. So that's what we faced on the good side of the city. So I can only imagine what Jane was up against in her first few years of business on the other side of the city. And so I think we need to find a way as a community to attract more business, to invest in uh, the underserved uh, parts of town and, and to try to support them and uh, those most vulnerable. And it's gonna have to be a private public partnership um, because often left to their own devices, the public sector would be too slow and the private sector makes a conscious decision not to invest in that space. Um, and so that's with regard to preschools and, and in my community and what I see at large. One thing I want to make sure that I include today, because I think it might be one of the most important things for the audience, is a website, um, which is the Trust for Public Land. And we had discussed whether we could do a, a shade, um, shared screen here or, or something else, but we thought it would be a little bit too tough to navigate. 
So I would just invite everyone on their own browsers to, to go to that uh, website. So that would be tpl.org. And on there, if you navigate and look at parks, what you're gonna see is an incredibly robust database that they call their park score. And within the park score, they will rank every city in the United States. And I've tested many small towns in Wisconsin that did show up there, had a little bit less data than, than other places, but I was still impressed that they even uh, showed up. And they rank uh, the top 100 prominently, and they're ranking them in terms of access, acreage, investment, amenities, and equity. And per the start of our discussion today, I think the two most relevant things would be access and what they determine access is a 10 minute walk from your home. And uh, on my introduction, you said that this is uh, something that is near and dear to my heart and something that I'm actively working on is uh, to build playgrounds in communities uh, to provide that access. And then also equity. So where are the parks placed? who is being served by them, broken down by income as well as race. They go one step further that I think will be really impressive and uh, uh, applicable to the architects um, on here and designers on here would be, they then show a map physically showing where the parks are placed within the city and how that might impact your design and what you would include in a given site, given proximity to other parks um, and with that in mind. So again, that was the, what I wanted to lead with was making sure that as we talk about disinvestment, where to invest, there's resources out there. Um, and when it comes to parks, this is an incredible one. And I would invite everyone uh, to visit that space, see which cities in the United States are underinvested in Oklahoma City is coming in at number 100, for example, and uh, see what you can do to support them and uh, aid them in their process of growth. Great, thank you. Um, Marcel, Marcel and Suzanne, uh, uh, an example of a, a disinvestment um, in Berlin or um, in your neck of the woods? Well, um, well, as trained as an architect, can you hear me? This works. Yeah. Yes. Okay, well, as trained as an architect, um, you always learn these uh, famous sayings, Louis Kahn, uh, architecture is the thoughtful making of space. So I think that's fine. But when the pandemic came up, uh, there were other questions, like how do you organize public space or the resources of public space, especially in the inner city areas? as we're talking about Berlin, and who organizes these spaces? Well, we're not talking about all these beautiful historic parks we have here, but all these small um, leftovers, more or less. So Marcel and I, we had the idea of, um, well, we met six years ago in, in Paris. We were invited on a, on a conference uh, which were called, which was called uh, the greener, the merrier, and we had the chance to look at lots of initiatives in Paris to uh, improve the living quality in the city for the citizens. And these ideas uh, put us to the idea to connect our students and somehow to connect architecture and agriculture and uh, um, agroecology. So we had this new word, um, agritecture, and ask our students if they would join uh, uh, in an interdisciplinary class to, to improve these places as students as well as citizens. And um, well, then it was a bit hard with the pandemic because we couldn't go together to these places. We had so many Zoom meetings and finally we met, uh, well, last week, finally we, we met each other in person, which was a very funny situation to see people, you always see the heads and now they see the full body and so on. But this, this um, organization, organization of urban space as place where people live and stay 
when all cafes, restaurants, shops, shopping malls, institutions, even university, schools, everything is closed. So how do you how do you um, get quality space in an urban area? That was our question. But Marcel? <laughs> well, maybe one, one aspect to, to add on that is I busily took notes and a few of the aspects that were, were mentioned where Jane said that she built a community garden and we heard about, um, we had a question about the role of nature and biophilic um, design and now me being not an architect but being well originally a forester and then a biologist and done lots of things with, with plants of, of course the, the plant world is close to my heart and what we always kept in mind in our project is that there has to be something green and green not only in the sense of like having a green wallpaper but really as a living organism, as living organisms that you interact with, that you can touch, that you can smell, that um, has a, a, the plants that, that have a course, a change of color over the year. So really that you are surrounded by, by life. And I would be interested to maybe hear something about that later on. Um, whether there are any studies or whether any one of you has looked at any studies, how the interaction really with living beings, particularly with plants, also affects the neuronal neural development of, of children or people. Actually, I have a feeling it strongly does mm -hmm. because there are actually studies that, for example, your cognitive development appears to be better when you are out of doors a lot and, and in Scandinavian countries, they have these schools that are outside all the time, Denmark and Sweden, for example. And we wanted to include these, these aspects and bring in the plant world as something to interact with. Uh, Sarah, I saw you uh, agreeing, uh, nodding in agreement with the- uh... I as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can, you, uh, can you share your thoughts? Oh, sure. Just, you know, I think there's a lot of research and increasingly a, a lot of research that really links, you know, healthy and high quality child development to experiences with nature. And that goes for everything from really good eyesight development, because when you're out in nature, you're forced to focus on objects at different lengths, different distances away from you. And so you, that's really good experience for eyesight development. Um, I've done some work at, with the local Seattle zoo here with, um, uh, looking at a project to develop children's empathy with, with animal experiences. So the more that you talk about all animals as having families and, you know, having routines in their day and needing to, you know, find a place to sleep at night, the more kids start to relate to that and develop empathy over time. Um, it just, the list goes on and on. That's why I'm not even getting into, you know, like physical motor kind of development pieces, but um, yes, for sure. I think the bottom line is, is nature for sure helps children's development. Um, can you, uh, Sarah, can you um, provide an example of uh, disinvestment in, in Seattle or, or Pittsburgh? Sure. Um, so, so, you know, I think, so, so plan, Playful Learning Landscape Action Network, um, you know, we've been really focused on thinking about informal learning opportunities for children and families. And I think as much as the focus, at least in the U.S. here, has been on um, providing more access to high quality formal learning environments, which would be things like universal preschool, et cetera. And I, you know, I'm a, I obviously will champion that effort till my dying day because I think it's, you know, incredibly important. Um, however, we also know that kids only spend about 20% of their waking hours in those formal learning environments. And I think one thing that we have not yet considered quite as much is what happens during that other 80% of their time. So really thinking about children in communities in that sort of systems-based model where, you know, a child exists in a family, a family exists in a community, the community exists, you know, in that larger, um, you know, state 
country, et cetera. Um, and so when you start to think about what those, what those ripples look like, what are those experiences that kids have that might not be in those formal learning environments? And how does that differ by communities? So you might imagine for some children in some communities, and this gets into you know, the other side of town uh, or the other part of town, but you know, some children might have really easy access to the Seattle Zoo um, and be able to pay for that and have somebody who can take them. Um, some kids might have a bookshelf that's filled with really, you know, child appropriate, uh, age appropriate books and have caregivers who can read and will have the time to spend reading with them. And other children don't. And so what can we do from a community perspective to think about um, really amping up the playful learning opportunities that exist in communities, in places and spaces where families naturally are. And so we're starting to think about reimagining, you know, what a bus stop looks like. What if you provide playful learning opportunities at a bus stop? Families and caregivers and children are spending time there anyway. What if we give them that, that time and opportunity to really turn that into a playful learning environment? The same would go for you know, a grocery store. That's something that has to exist in your day and your, your week and your month. So what if there are opportunities there and we put in signage that prompts you to sort produce or talk about you know, your favorite food or your cultural traditions around a food? And in fact, we know what happens, right? Because we've done the research. And so you start to see these you know, enormous increases in parent-child interaction Parents and children, caregivers and children are talking more, they're using more robust language, uh, more difficult language, they're having back and forth conversations, all things that we know are great predictors of later development. Um, and you know these, these are enormous effects too. We're talking like anywhere between 30 and 60% effects, which in the world of you know, developmental research is, is really you know, quite remarkable. And so I think you know, as we get to, to really considering these other learning environments, I want us to be, be thinking about the opportunities that exist um, sort of beyond those formal school walls also. I mean, formal school, of course, incredibly important, but what could we do to create a, a, a community that is really focused on early learning and supporting those opportunities for kids? I'd like to piggyback on what Sarah just said because um, true to Future Ready by Five, uh, we are partnering with the Columbus Metropolitan Library, a really innovative, amazing group of um, folks that are really deeply invested in the community. And it's not just about books or videos or links. They really, uh, they, they have that holistic view of children and families and in, in the culture society communities as well. Um, but they are a strategy leader in Future Ready by Five. And one of the things you said, Sarah, about the playful learning environment, they are, um, they're one of our first strategies that's lifting actually has lifted and they are doing, when you mentioned the grocery stores, it made me think of that, just ways to embed literacy, not like sit down and read a book right now, but how can you use this environment to nurture conversation between adult and child and in this more authentic learning place? So barbershops, bus stops, um, grocery stores, that's going on. And um, I was looking over here at one of my teammates because the project manager for in, uh, the implementation office, um, there's going to be an Instagram live on the 17th of September at 2 p.m. Future Ready Columbus and where Kathy Shabadagi from the Columbus Metropolitan Library is going to be talking about that very thing. So. There you go. How's that for a real life example of what you just said, Sarah? The other thing that um, um, I think is kind of interesting, and I have not read this research firsthand, but the CEO of a local museum, the Center of Science and Industry, COSI, Dr. Frederick Bertley, shared with me that when children um, visit a museum, they just once, one time a year is all it takes, they begin to believe that they could be um, a scientist right? Just from that immersed, that in, uh, opportunity to be, to be in, immersed in the environment. So actually, COSI is another strategy leader, and they're bringing um, the conservatory and um, the art museum to the table to say how, and then that involves transportation. There goes that holistic view again. How can we provide that opportunity for every child in Franklin County to have the opportunity to visit these museums free once a year? 
and give them, make sure there's transportation to get them there. Again, just making connections, making connections. So uh, we, we hope to have a lot of scientists and botanists. I'm sure that would make you really happy, Marcel. <laughs> have future, uh, what's the word? Agri, agritecture. I think yeah. that's right. Something like that, right? It's happening. <laughs> Great. Um, David, uh, can I get uh, uh, your input on, um, uh, Sarah brought up um, having play spaces at uh, like bus stops or um, other non-traditional locations. What do you, how do you feel about that? Well, I think that's amazing. And my first thought was actually as a parent rather than as a educator. And I'm thinking about pushing a shopping cart around the grocery store and telling my kids not to touch anything. <laughs> and how amazing that would be if there was a space where they were supposed to touch everything and they would learn about the fruits and vegetables um, even more so than, than what I'm able to you know, support at home. And um, so that just blows my mind. And I think that I'm, I'm making notes. So if you see me over here on the side of the computer, it's not, uh, I'm not texting anybody. I'm taking, <laughs> taking notes from all this wonderful information. So um, I found that uh, spot on and something that, you know, we will try to bring locally here as well. I think it's awesome. Um, Marcel and Susan, uh, or Suzanne, uh, are there any ways we can bring um, uh, play spaces into, uh, like, um, I want to uh, a combination of green, like nature, and play spaces uh, together beyond just like a rooftop garden or something. Just, just one thing this, uh, well, as a mother, I know this uh, problem David has to keep the kids uh, from touching everything. Well, the point is uh, we asked Marcel to make, make a, a lecture on plants, which are nice to get touched at. We called them kuschelpflanzen. plants. My, my English isn't uh, like, like, like like a cuddly, cuddly <laughs> plant, or plant that invites to pet them. Uh, and so uh, the, this was quite a challenge for the students to see plants not exactly as something which is like green or nice to look at, but that they can touch and experience these things. And uh, another idea um, to, to Jane, although we worked with um, university students, I, I'm, I'm deeply convinced learning, you can't force somebody to learn or to read a book, but if it's playful or if mm. it's in, in an experimental way, and then somehow they, uh, the ideas explode and they are open to new things and other discussions start. And I think that's the most important part of, of learning to get uh, to be willing and to get engaged in something uh, new, something different, and to figure out how things can work. So, yes, maybe we sh well, if you're interested, we can show you this some of the we have some sample slides of the classes we had in this winter term. And, and maybe just one word or two. Mm, some of the pictures are from a huge, huge, huge development project here in Berlin, which is adjacent to the Natural Berlin Natural History Museum. And it is a it is an absolutely enormous project with 630 million euro. And what they are building is what is called Wissenschaftscampus, a science campus. Um, this campus really is to serve the third mission, the, the communication of science to the people, to the population. Now, one part of the build, one of the buildings of the historic buildings is the former agricultural college of Berlin, where there's still the agricultural department in there. And what we did is, because obviously what will happen is that some super duper famous um, star company, a star <laughs> architect, um, will probably get that and get paid gazillions of euros and, for it. And, and just a second, and this site where you see all these uh, slides, 
It's more or less a parking lot between the museum and other campus buildings. So at the moment, it's sort of a wasteland. There's really nothing attractive. And the students' job was to develop something which they would like to be students at and to go there and sit and learn and read and meet other people. So and I think, Susanna, we were, Susanna we, were, we were being disruptive because um, we decided, hmm, well, let's plan this with students. Let's not wait for the international famous architecture firm to, to design this, but hey, we'll do it with the students who use that space. And because that, that space or that place of learning is very dear to my heart, and I see that there's a, a great potential about being a part of the Department of Agriculture and also being a visiting scientist to the Natural History Museum. I asked to them, well, couldn't we take this mm -hmm. as an example for our, for our students? And we did, and we had the students plan it. And you, what you see are some of the slides and you see that they all are full of plants. So it was actually quite an, an interesting interaction because Suzanne being the, the, the architect and the designer, mm -hmm. these were the things that the students had to talk with you mm -hmm. about. And, and they asked me about well, the plants, would this work, would that work? But it was not only meant to be ornamental plants, but they really should have an, architect, an, an, an educational dimension to it for all ages. So these are plants that can be touched, that have a scent to them and a memorable scent. Some are edible so that maybe families can come and, and, and their children can eat the plant and have maybe a new experience of an aroma. But it's also storied plants so that you literally can go and, and, and tell a story about a particular species. We have, for example, some plants that are living living fossils. So we encourage the students in a rather playful way and say, hey, what do they keep there in the Natural History Museum? This is a place where they keep dinosaurs. I mean, everybody loves dinosaurs. People are not gonna come to the museum because they, they want to see some graph or some um, mathematical equation. They, they, they come for a dinosaur and kids love it and you have to feed them. So we encourage them to look for plants that would have been around really in the Jurassic times or Cretaceous times. And there are a few examples around, like in, I think Yale University has a Cretaceous garden. And there is a beautiful example in, in LA, the, the La Brea Tarpets Museum has a garden of a Pleistocene garden. And so we encourage mm -hmm. students to find out about that. But well, um, I don't want to talk too much. And so we just have a few slides and Susanna can talk more we, about we, this. We took, well, actually, we had some dinosaur uh, <laughs> designs as well. Um, but we chose these slides because the students concentrated very much on the quality of this outside space or the interaction of architecture of Hui space, for example, here a roof garden where you see the famous Berlin TV station in the background. And uh, the, some questions like uh, feeling safe, even uh, um, when it's getting dark and these outside places. So to somehow to change this standard um, uh, separation. This is the house, this is the architecture, and this is the space in between. So it's just mixing things. And for example, um, as here, they said it's it's difficult, it's it's really important to have light. Light, even in dark time, to keep the place first attractive, that you can have a sort of orientation, that you feel safe. Uh, here also you see a pond or a little fountain, whatever. Uh, I think this is quite crucial because uh, well, we have a really hot September here in Berlin. We have a climate change. You need some water and water is also an attractive place to, to spend some time. To play. <laughs> and to play and to sit there with your book or whatever. 
And then you need uh, shelter for rain and snow and wind. So to have all these little things in between, it's not an interior space, it's not an exterior space. It's as an ancient architecture, all these layers in between. And you can choose where you want to go to, where you want to sit and read your book or do uh, phone calls or watching other people or just having meeting friends and, and do some sports and all these things. So we said there's no space like a waste space or leftover space. It's up to us to, uh, to, to show people how these spaces can have quality, quality to stay. And if there's a quality to stay, to spend time, then people like to stay there and they start doing interactions as we experienced uh, in the summer in some of Berlin parks, mm. which were sort of uh, not parks anymore, but um, living rooms. So this is, I think, an experience. I do hope uh, that it will continue even after the pandemic, that it's, um, in, in the, it's a social interaction in urban open space. Um. Quite long. Sorry. <laughs> oh no, no problem, uh, Marcel. You were uh, uh, so the your students, um, Marcel and, and Suzanne, both of your students worked on the on this project that we have, uh, um, mm -hmm. or a few sites. Is this the same project? Well, this is the same where we had a hundred students okay. all together, and they were architecture students and agriculture students, and um, they made in Zoom, yeah. this was the difficulty. We had the idea they should go together and sit together at a table and uh, work and do models and sketches and discuss things. Uh, but this was difficult. We mm -hmm. had only these Zooms. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's the same project in different perspectives. Um, it's, uh, the, you mentioned that the, um, the students were encouraged to play during this um, mm -hmm during the design of this. Uh, David, Sarah, Jane, um, uh, and Marcel and Suzanne, uh, can, uh, can you speak to um, how playful learning can apply to higher education and beyond? I'm happy to kick us off. I mean, I, th I think that on a very fundamental level, the way that kids learn is the way that humans learn. Um, and so the more that we can incorporate that into all aspects, you know, I think uh, for a while we were, uh, there was a concern in the United States, at least that preschool was starting to look a little bit more like, you know, the K-12 system. And I think that that's the exact opposite direction that we need to go and, and really think about, you know, modeling the K-12 system a little bit more off of preschool and the early learning environment. Um, you know, it, so I, I think that that's, that's, you know, at a very fundamental level. Um, we have five principles that we always use in terms of how children and humans learn best when we're, when we're thinking about designing our spaces. They, and so the idea is that we know that kids and humans learn best when the meaning, when the activity or content context is meaningful, joyful, socially interactive, actively engaging and iterative. So those are our those are our five principles um, that really guide that guide our work. And you know, and this is an example of one of our um, uh, 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 neighborhood park parks um, that it's, it was previously an empty lot that we worked with a neighborhood association to turn into a playful learning space for children. So you'll see a mural on the back wall. Um, these kids are, are going through an installation that we call stories. So those uh, discs on the ground each have icons on them and kids can jump from disc, disc to disc and tell a different story every time. So that's, you know, sort of that iterative component that they can come back again and again and it's different every time. 
Um, you'll see over to the right hand side here a game that we call jumping feet. It's a little bit like hopscotch, except for the rules are different. So here, when you see two feet, you have oh, there you go again. Yes, that's a better that's a better view of it. Um, so here, when you see two feet, you have to jump with one foot, and when you see one foot, you have to jump with two feet. And there's a lot of really good research that shows that that's working your executive function skills, which are those skills that are um, the 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 skills that allow you how to, that allow you to improve how you learn. So it's it's not the content knowledge per se. It's really thinking about about those higher order cognitive skills. And so there's really good, um, and we've done it, you know, in, in these in tiles like this in more of a museum setting, we've actually put this into sidewalks. Um, there's a, a, a sidewalk in Seattle, actually. Um, we worked with the Department of Early Learning here in Seattle. Um, and they had some funding from the Safe Routes to School program and were installing a sidewalk anyway. And so with very little extra funds, we added this jumping feet installation onto that sidewalk. Um, and all of a sudden, you know, kids, kids know what to do with a little prompt. They know the twist to the game. And we're working executive function skills as kids are walking to school. Um, you know, so I think in terms of, of thinking about how humans learn, and I will also say that these, the spaces that we create are really intended to be very intergenerational spaces. So as much as we are focused, you know, I, I come from a child development background, I want to see those child development outcomes, we know that's very important later on. Um, but we also want spaces that that engage children, engage families, engage caregivers. Um, because we know that the more that caregivers and families are engaged, the more children are going to be engaged. Um, and then this is just another image. This is our uh, supermarket speak or one example of it. So you follow Andy the apple through the store and, and he gives you little prompts and things to do as you're grocery shopping. Sarah, I absolutely love that you combine the playing with a story or with the stories, because if you ask what are the two things that children love most, um, well, apart from ice cream, perhaps, it would be playing and it would be stories. And I, I don't want to go too far away from the topic of playing, but actually, don't we learn really by creating stories? We always want to have a plot. We always want to have a, a hero or be the hero. Um, and, and so I firmly believe, and that was one thing in our project as well, that a storied space or a storied place is very, very important, very helpful for learning. So for example, we discussed with our students what this place that which they were working with and that they were designing and, and, and changing and developing, what was actually the, the story. So we, we really discussed when was it where, where the adjacent buildings made, what was there before. For example, there is deep down there is an, an old, an ancient iron foundry. And you can even go back to, to the ice age. So there are many, many layers of history and of story in there. And if you look at a place like the center of Berlin, obviously you see many traces of, of, of history and, and stories um, some of them being like, like bullets in, in the wall and that sort of thing. But you can read the place and maybe create your own story. And sometimes you can tell the story with plants. But I don't want to go too far mm -hmm. away um, from the playing theme. But actually, you can also play with plants if it has a structure. It, it is a natural toy sometimes. And playing, where well, these were the last steps of their work to do it on the computer, to do these renderings. But the first steps were to play with the space, to use carbon box or clay or whatever they had at home and to, to get an experience of the space and also just to, to play with paper or whatever. And do some experience and uh, somehow feel, they should feel free to design their own place. And I think that's something when you do your own thing, then you are more engaged. Then so you are getting into it and you spend a lot of more, more, more time on it also. I think somehow we expected students to complain because we ask for more and more and more slides and models yeah. and photos and 
collages and photo montages, but we got this. They did really, they, did they? They, they <laughs> did. <laughs> they, they worked and came up with these yeah. things. And uh, so I think also these, I think what, what is also another thing, the, the students, most of the students uh, didn't meet personally. So they had to get along only uh, with social media to make the teams. So this was quite an experiment. Can you really do this work with somebody? You, you're not sitting next to each other on the desk or in, in, the, in the model workshop or whatever. And it worked, I think, because it was, you know, the students had the feeling they're designing their university. So and I think that's what's uh, very important to people to have, to get them in their story, in their life. Um, David, um, higher learning and uh, playful learning, higher education, playful learning. Yeah, um, I didn't know if you were going to segue that one, or I appreciate you throwing it back to me. Oh yeah, it's, yeah. It's kind of the, the cornerstone of the well. So uh, my preschool was essentially designed around this concept, and uh, what I was hearing from Susan as she was talking about the cuddly plants was that um, it's this balance between um, teaching and learning. Mm -hmm. right and how that takes place and, and when we need one to have the other and when we don't and what is doing the teaching does it have to be the teacher can it be a space can it be a plant can it be uh, these different environments and so one thing we did in our school design was to take the pressure off of the instructor was to try to facilitate as much learning as possible from the environment and the space so that it's not all having to come top down from the teacher and um, you know, more so the interaction with, with peers. And you know, we, uh, we did this in a lot of different ways to give some specific examples, but would be we had one room that was just AstroTurf on the floor. So the entire room, no furniture, just AstroTurf. And then we'd bring in different manipulatives and there would be tons of space to run and move and play and laugh. And you would give them uh, something that is curved on top, like a platform that they're supposed to stand on and balance. But what do they do? They flip it upside down and they make it into a boat, you know? So it's just, they just take the space and they run with it and they have such vivid and wild imaginations that I think uh, they do everyone, I should not just they, not little children, all of us do really well when we can make the space our own, when we can uh, be creative and imaginative and have a um, pretend world going on in our head, uh, even as adults, I think. Well, this is where this class, this architecture class was, uh, where this is another our experiment with Zoom. We did very few lectures because the lectures were so boring <laughs> in Zoom. So we, we had more little jobs to get them done. And I think this, this worked. So this was, a new, as you mentioned, the instructor or the, the teacher. So this is another experience for me. It's not necessary to do all these lectures. <laughs> you get to have the people get to, to do the things, to get into it, and then it works automatically somehow. Well, not in every topic on every subject, but in the design process, I think it makes sense. And to we, when we engage, well, when human beings engage in that um, collaborative process, that collegial type mm -hmm. of um, environment, you know, I mean, we're all diff have different passions and expertise, for instance, on this screen. So we were given a, just a general idea to create something, think of what we could do as a group where if I was just given the assignment and I went off on my own and David, you went off on your own and Sarah, you went off on your own, we would miss the magic of what would happen between that, between and among that exchange, right? Uh, so I think that living and working and learning in isolation, it's limiting. So, and we miss the teachers among us. And a lot of the projects or plants that students came up with were actually quite humorous thinking of it. So they did 
they did play. Like one one of my my favorite examples was they they created one one pavilion at the entrance of the museum in the shape of a dinosaur skull, and which was illuminated and had, had mosses and ferns growing on top of it. It looked fabulous, but then. You, you had the, the, the view of the, the building in the evening, and it looked as if there were birds flying over the museum. But if you looked closer, it was actually flying pterosauruses, <laughs> like the, the flying dinosaurs. And so, so you could really see how they how they loved the, the story and how they got into it and wanted to write like a crazy colorful story. And I thought that was wonderful, but there are more they, examples really, like that. Yeah, well, the point is that I was thinking when well, if I saw these dinosaur drawings to my architecture colleagues, they would think, what they do? What did they do? <laughs> and then there was this invitation to the uh, third mission exhibition at Humboldt mm. University, and they asked for some sample uh, pictures to illustrate the texts, and the text, mm. Marcel wrote the texts, and I uh, took some samples and I, we decided to be we offer the dinosaur to the dinosaur picture and the museum choose the the university mm -hmm. and the museum they they took the dinosaur image <laughs> it's on their website yeah. so this is this was it's, it's the most funniest thing actually oh I regret I didn't uh, took it to, to this panel uh, where I think it's still in internet. It is. It's, uh, it is in the internet. But interestingly, the, the playfulness in there was really, it was contagious. And yeah. so I, I had the impression that it was kind of mirroring forth and back when we were enjoying it or getting into a, a topic that was exciting, amusing, or whatever. Then, then the students, of course, feel it as well because we were in a constant process of, of communication. And so we could see if we, we brought in an, an, an aspect like that, which had this um, more playful um, um, side to it, they would certainly take it up and develop it, take it further. Mm -hmm. I firmly and believe in I'm not play. Sure. <laughs> I'm not sure we have here another object on the desk. I just put it ah, yeah. up. I'm not sure if you can see this. It's a glass. And in the glass, there's a garden. It's a called a uh, flush and garden. Like the bottle garden. Bottle, really come bottle. In there, no, can you, can you see it? Yeah, it's we so can see it. it. Okay. So mm -hmm. this was something else. Uh, a colleague of uh, Marcel offered the students to do this experiment at home. Everybody is home. So why don't you have a little garden and a bottle? And this was another uh nice uh ergebnis um result result yeah. to have uh, the big space the urban space and this really inner interior space <laughs> and uh, then you figured out this is actually very much in fashion in berlin the most fanciest uh, department store kdv yeah you get mm -hmm. they have all these fancy clothes and shoes and whatever and they have bottle gardens and they are really expensive <laughs> so the students did them so it's uh, it's all these these coincidences somehow where playing and commercial things and art and uh, architecture and uh, social and political uh, discussions on, on nature and climate change, they all, suddenly they all go together. And then you have a new idea in your head. Well, it was, it was definitely the challenge to do all this online <laughs> because we couldn't go with a student and, and say, um, touch this plant, touch this rock, um, smell, smell this or that. Um, so we, we didn't have really this, central experience of the environment mm, but well maybe we challenge their fantasy then even more so i'm very curious how the next term will be if we are again in zoom uh -huh. or if we can all meet and uh, have a nice field trip to the botanical garden yes and uh, finally have one of these great lectures marcel gives on plants it's uh, that's something else I think I experienced uh, 
the lectures, we didn't do normal lectures, but how long do students are able to concentrate and actually listen? And if it's a funny story, something incredibly, incredibly different from the normal things, then they are quiet and they are listening and uh, it works. Oh, it totally does. Uh, and <laughs> and th th this is why I completely believe or share Sarah's opinion um, when, when you mentioned the, the link between the play and the stories that you have to give or offer a story and ideally allow mm -hmm. for the story to be continued or developed. Um, I'd like to, um, uh, the project that, um, that you showed and um, Sarah, you were speaking about the, um, uh, the your Zoom background, the project, that project. Um, starting with Sarah, the um, a lot of these projects are very uh, urban focused. Um, how would this uh, how would this translate to a, a rural community um, where um, there might not be there might only be one in a centralized location? Oh, take it away, Sarah. <laughs> Sure, yeah, and we've done a lot of work really thinking about what some commonalities are. And I will say that incorporating these playful learning landscapes is, is certainly possible in both urban and rural settings. It looks different and there are, there are different pieces to the process. Um, you know, one of the pieces that we use that is sort of a cornerstone of all of our different installations and processes is community engagement. And when I say community engagement, I mean incredibly deep community engagement. We are oftentimes, um, you know, really taking the role of support people in the sense that we want all of these projects to be designed by the community um, you know, installed by the community, evaluated by the community, um, maintained by the community. So we're really, you know, kind of there to put that, that structure in place and to, you know, guide and help and assist as necessary. Um, but we, we do a lot of rich community engagement to make sure that everything that we do is, you know, nothing is ever cookie cutter. It's always really customized to the, the needs, desires, culture, um, values of whatever community we're working in. And so to, you know, because of that, I think that, you know, it, every project is different and you'll, you know, you'll see different uh, projects being, you know, very, very, look very, very different, whether there are, you know, two projects, you know, in different communities in the same urban environment, or if it's a, you know, a project in a rural environment. And I will, you know, anecdotally, we're working with right now with a city, um, a rural town in, in Pennsylvania, um, and they are, they're, they're really thinking about what this might look like. Of course, there's no public transportation system. So, you know, bus stop kinds of designs are off the table, but they have, you know, the grocery store that has a little green space out front. So we're trying to think about what we could do with that green space, um, because that's, that's the place where everybody in this town goes. Um, you know, and I, you know, very naively at the beginning of this project mentioned something about city permits to the, the community based organization we were working with, which, you know, when we're working in urban environments, getting the city permits can be a very long and arduous process. And her immediate response was, oh, no worries, my brother in law works there, we'll get it done tomorrow. <laughs> and so you have these sort of pros and cons, and the, the process is going to look a little bit different, um, whether it's a rural environment, whether it's an urban environment. But you know, certainly possible, and I think you know, centered on that community engagement that really ensures that what we're doing is is the exact right project for that community in that moment. Um, David, uh, do you have any thoughts um, on uh, play spaces in a rural um, and maybe a neglected rural community? Yeah, so I think my the only thought that I'd want to share uh, on this uh, to build on what Sarah was saying is, and it's, um, you know, a message that I was thinking about when it came to architecture and some of the other uh, questions that you had posed, um, is that you want to give them what they don't have, right? So in an urban setting, is that going to be more open space? And is that going to be more uh, plant life? And is that going to be more um materials that they don't normally see and the same would then be true i feel like in a rural setting give them what they don't have so maybe it's a little bit heavier space 
Maybe it feels more like a city. Maybe it feels more like a pop-up art installation that is um, really abstract and, and something they're not gonna see for a hundred miles. Um, so an overriding concept that, that guided a lot of my answers to upcoming questions is to give them what they don't have. Okay. Um, so switching, um, switching uh, gears for a moment. Um, uh, so services provided by uh, schools such as, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, free breakfast and lunch and transportation um, and after school, after school programs are essential for some families. Um, if these services were not provided, uh, they could be considered a barrier to education. Uh, what are some impediments uh, to students getting the most ed out of uh, their education uh, that you know of? Um, uh, whether it be in Berlin or Seattle. Um, we can start with Sarah. Sure, I mean, I think, you know, I've been thinking a lot lately about how, what, how these informal learning environments really shape that. So I think, you know, on some level, this cycles back a little bit to what we've been talking about in the sense of really making sure that communities have spaces that are accessible for all children that are designed by the communities. I mean, I, I think, you know, the, the last thing that we ever want to do is, is go in and impose something on a community. It has to be designed by the community. Um, and, and, and I think that one of the things that that means for us when we go into a community and are um, working to listen to the community is, is actually listening. And I know, Jane, you talked about this a lot too, is it's just doing a lot of listening. Um, and then I think that the next step is and believing what you hear, right? Um, so communities are going to tell you what they need, what they want, and what they value. And I think that there's a, a little bit of a talent to um, to getting out of your own way to, to really hear what they're saying for, to you. Um, you know, I think one of the things that we have done, which has been a, a really fun process, um, you know, going back to, you know, adults learn like children learn, um, is creating playful community engagement experiences for communities that both give us information about what a community might need and what they value, but also um, act as, as sort of inherently valuable experiences for the community. So, so it's sort of moving away from the focus group model in a sense, and we've worked with um, a group in Philadelphia actually to create a board game. It's a community engagement board game. And the idea is communities get together for game night and they play this board game, but the board game asks questions like, you know, tell us about, um, you know, you've discovered this a map of, of the most magical learning spaces in your community, draw the map. And so we're getting information via the board game about, you know, the kinds of places and spaces that are important to that community. Um, there's, you know, some categories that talk about meaning and stories. And so you're talking about, you know, what's the one food that you can't find at your local grocery grocery store that you go out of your way to find because that has cultural significance for you. Um, and so we're trying to think about different ways to, to create these community engagement experiences because at the end of the day, we collect those cards and that's data for us in terms of how we can start to design spaces and places for that community. And the community leaves feeling like, wow, I just had a really great bonding experience with other members of my community. So I think, you know, going through that rich community engagement process um, is going to give you a lot of, of really rich information and, and get you to some of those, you know, what those barriers are, right? And identify some of those barriers for you. Because if it's the case that, you know, we actually don't really have a spot in our, in our neighborhood that we all community or that we all can congregate in, um, that's good information. That's really good data for us. And, and, and to start to, you know, as you have these conversations, as you listen, you can start to figure out exactly what those barriers look like and how they're different and similar between communities. I think the pandemic certainly um, pointed out the barriers. I mean, some of the barriers are quite obvious. And then uh, when, when the rug is pulled out from so many people's, all of our, all of our lives, right? Our, what we count as norm, as a normal day, um, I think for those who are economically disadvantaged, it was a bigger rug that was pulled out from under their feet. When I think of, you were mentioning the wraparound services. So when I think about um, 
sometimes the best meal a child might get is the breakfast and the lunch that they get at school. So I know that when schools were closed, that was a big concern, like how we need, we need to make sure our children are eating. Um, so I think about what happened, for instance, in the Columbus City Schools, if you could walk, if you had, if you had the opportunity right? If you had access, if you didn't have to ride a school bus to get to your school. So uh, walk and get your meal. And I know that the children were given meals, you know, for a week or for more, more than, more than just the, the student. Um, or there were school buses that where, where children could not get to the schools. They, they lived, um, the transportation was a barrier and the bus drivers know their route. They know the children, they know the families. So food was loaded up on school buses. You have the relationship with the bus driver, you have the wheels and you have the food and to, to connect those. So um, that's just a food thing. And I think of how our Mid-Ohio Food Collective really rallied to get food into the homes of, of so many hungry people. So I think that the, although the pandemic certainly isolated us and, and we're, we're all too familiar with that, it also rallied the common good within our hearts to find a way to, to help, help our neighbor, right? Uh, I, one of the things that troubled me greatly, and I'm sure it does you, and, it, and it's still troubling, is the families, the, the, um, the parents who didn't have an option to work from home and to pay their rent and to uh, have food, they had to go to work. Well, where, where, where do the children go, right? That was a huge crisis and it's not, it has not really gone away because there's access um, challenges and, opportun and opportunity challenges. And, you know, the, so once again, the social supports, the social fabric of coming alongside those families had to rise to the occasion and, and great the, the, as, the, as the response was, it still lingers. I was just on a call today with uh, child care providers that are just hanging on by a whisker to keep their doors open because of the way um, funding works in, in money coming into systems, in, into child care centers. It's attendance-based. You, you put that into the uh, rules and regulations about attendance, and suddenly a center that was making it with a very small margin now has half the number of children and, you know, you factor in wages and the lack of benefits and the lack of qualified candidates. And truly it's challenging. That's a kind word for it. That, that doesn't begin to cover the depth of the challenges that, that exist and that are still confront us um, on many, many levels. Uh, Jane, can you, um, talk about support models for parents who struggled to educate or entertain their at-home kids during the pandem pandemic and anybody else can tag on to that as well. Uh, I know neighbors helped neighbors out and certainly school systems helped out with um, online learning and uh, support groups that were online. Uh, libraries rose to the occasion in providing um, it depends on which degree of the continuum, where are we talking about? Because there was a time when none of us could leave, basically leave our homes and we couldn't go any place. And those interventions were different than where we are today. And, um, and there was many, many, you know, iterations in between. Um, you know, at the end of the day, when we think about play, let's go back to that. And it's okay to be outside a bit, mm -hmm. like just not with masses of people. Just to go out and walk, take a walk around the block. I know our daughter who has young children uh, knew that she watched the landscape in her neighborhood. And when it was safest to go for a walk in the morning was when the children first woke up and they're young. So it's early and they were still in their PJs. They got out and they were in the neighborhood. They were at the first ones at the park playing before anyone else came. So there are ways to um, combat that, combat the challenges before us. But um, and just looking at normal everyday things, you mentioned, uh, David, where you just would put manipulatives out on, the, out on the floor and see what kids could do. Okay, so give them spoons and pots and pans and get ready for the band, get ready for the marching band around your house. So you don't have to go to school to learn. And you don't have, I mean, yes, we have to learn how, how to help one another to be creative with the resources that we have, but it's possible. 
It is, it is possible. You just go on a color walk, go out, look outside your window, listen for the trucks. What do you hear? Do a listening walk there. You know, like there's the educator in me coming out. It, it can go on and on and on. But if you've not been raised in, the, in that environment and know those kind of things, it's challenging to know what to do all day, every day with your child who's getting on your last nerve and you're figuring out how you're going to pay your bill. And oh, wait, I was called into work tomorrow, but then I lost my job last night. Like it's a mess. I hate to be Debbie Downer, but we really have challenges before us. Uh, we've, we've lived through them to date, but we have much work to do and we have to come together, right? We have to come together. I think I've heard that on every one of our calls, the value of, uh, on everyone on this call, the value of community, the value of collaboration, the value of communication, the value of caring. Can't, can't, over, uh, can't overstate that enough, actually. Uh, Marcel and Suzanne, uh, uh, can you speak to um, how it, how the, um, uh, what resources were available in uh, Germany uh, for um, uh, parents trying to support their uh, kids during the pandemic? Well, the situation probably is a little, a little different. Mm, there. Are, well, at least in Berlin, you would hardly have really those those food deserts or like like difficulties of, of families really feeding their kids. Well, it does it does occur, but it's probably not well not the same dimension. But what definitely is a huge problem, what Jane just just mentioned, if people had to go to work, if you cannot just log on. Or and work online, or even if you work online, if you live in a very, very small apartment, and lots of people in Berlin do, and you have one or two lively children or very small children, then it's just literally not possible to, to work and let, let alone and really care for the a child that can't go to school. So we, we had that here in our, our division at the, the university with a, a visiting scientist who has a very small child, and for her it was paradise to be like once a week here for a couple of hours to, to be able to do her work. Um, so that definitely was during the pandemic, a huge, huge issue. Then childcare is difficult anyway. If, like find a spot in a kindergarten or in nursery. Um, but there were also, hard. there were most nursery schools and kindergarten were closed. Yeah. So it's, well, um, I'm not really in this topic, but what I read in the newspaper or from um, uh, stories I heard even from students, it was sort of a women's job to get the kids uh, organized. And it's more or less the men who tried to keep on doing the jobs to earn the money. So this is something which is uh, astonishing, as I was always having the impression that in Berlin, you have a, a quite good uh, situation, um, female made, uh, female made to, to jobs. What I experienced personally in lots of Zoom calls, that there were quite a lot of female students who had difficulties to concentrate or just to stay in the, the Zoom because they had to take care uh, for smaller um, sister, mm. smaller siblings. Uh, siblings. Yeah, you see the chaos going on behind you, and, right? And, yeah. and you see there, it's it's not uh, a place to to sit down and to read a book and to learn because they were somewhere in the living room. And there was a huge TV set in the background. And it was yeah. something, just looking at the Zoom made me nervous. <laughs> so I, that's something I experienced quite often. And the other thing is uh, meeting, well, you are not allowed to meet other people in the, this uh, first and uh, the really strict lockdown, but then it went on, on, on another level. Berlin is such a big city. So it's the distances, walking distances are really difficult. So, but if public transport is getting dangerous, mm. so how do people move from place A to uh, place B? So that's another thing. People started, uh, um, started to use bikes, 
So in the end now we have lots of bike lanes, which is a new development, but bike lanes and small kids and a bike and shopping and uh, a, a, a laptop, whatever. That's, uh, it's, that's getting dangerous. So these are all these effects which made, I think, the living for lots of people really difficult. I do have something positive. I forgot about this and I'm glad we had this conversation because it's worth sharing. It's, it was a beautiful thing that happened in our community. Um, I mentioned you know, how we need to rally together and early. So it seems like it was about 10 years ago because that's how harsh life has seemed when the pan pandemic first hit and we were really on lockdown. Um, our nationwide children, our children's hospital, our library system, um, uh, uh, children's advocacy group, Future Ready, and um, I'm leaving people a lot I know, and I apologize for that. Um, Ohio State University and the research, uh, the Crane Center for Research, we came together and uh, pooled funds so that we could purchase um, materials for families and then backpacks and then distributed those through the, um, like the um, community wellness centers for children, like pediatrics centers where there are relationships again. And um, that was a really positive thing. It, we all felt good, like we were doing something proactive. It actually served a felt need. And it brought uh, groups together that aren't typically in the same room. And we weren't, but we were on the Zoom room together planning all this. And corporations, private corporations donated money so that it, it, it truly was a, a, a wonderful community affair. And it's a, there's, there's a positive thing I can add to this discussion there along these lines. I can add one more positive thing too. Um, you know, I think that there, as much as, you know, obviously we would never wish to go through a pandemic again, um, but I do think that we have learned some things and I think that we have um, learned um, some ways to make even, you know, some of the interactions that we have with children and families more equitable. Um, and I think a good example of this is, um, I've done some work with the Office of Head Start at the national level and at a meeting recently, um, one of the Head Start centers was talking about how they used to, for parent meetings, um, offer an option for parents to either attend the, the meetings in person or um, call in via phone or Zoom. And they would typically have a mix of parents who, who did, you know, who took advantage of both options. Um, so they'd have some parents remotely, some parents in person. And of course, the pandemic forced everybody to go remotely. And what they discovered is so much more participation from all parents who attended the meeting, because what was the case of what had been happening without anybody really explicitly realizing it is that participation was only really happening from the folks who were in the room. And the folks who couldn't get there for whatever reason were, you know, trying to be there and attending via Zoom, but weren't really participating, weren't really, um, you know, showing up in that, in that moment because it just wasn't, it wasn't an equitable experience. And so from one of their learnings from the pandemic is all of these meetings are going to be only Zoom from now on because we eliminate that sort of inequitable experience that folks had really kind of level a playing field and then created a different kind of parent community. So I think to me, that was just a really great example of the ways that we sometimes need to check our assumptions. You know, clearly that Head Start Center thought they were doing a great thing by being as flexible as possible, but in the end, perhaps didn't create the most equitable environment for those, for those families. Um, so I think there have been some really great learnings that have come out of this, um, though we would never, of course, you know, force that on anyone in the world again. But um, I think it's I think it's good to do some reflection about what we have learned and what actually ended up working pretty well. Um, I would like to remind everyone that if you got if you have a question for the panelists, uh, you can put it in the uh, Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, uh, one more question. Um, so we've been, uh, this has been a, um, I would say a student focused uh, discussion of so far. Um, what can, um, how can architects um, uh, design for the educational experience of the uh, instructors? Uh, David, uh, do you wanna start us off? 
keep going to my picture and trying to click on that to unmute myself, but the unmute is in the bottom. So I got to keep reminding myself of that. <laughs> um, so I think it, it comes back to that thought that I shared earlier about give them what they don't have. Right. And so what does a teacher lack? And that's going to be a little bit different in every school. Um, uh, Jane shared that her, I believe her father was a superintendent. Um, I'm a fourth generation educator. Uh, oh. So uh, great grandparents, grandpa was a superintendent, dad is a principal, mom's a teacher, brother's a teacher, everybody's teachers, aunts, uncles. And one thing that they, um, what everybody wants is to feel comfortable in their space. So some of them teach at more challenging schools that at times can feel intimidating for a uh, five foot four teacher to be addressing a six foot tall uh, student. Um, and so what does a safe space feel like in terms of where they can uh, talk to the students? Is there a space where they can retreat to to feel, to feel safe? Are there um, you know, multiple doors within the room? Other things that uh, I think are universal across classrooms are having a flexible space. And these are things that are not going to be new to architects, but maybe a couple interesting thoughts that I had in that regard would be not just um, the utility of the same space, but altering the space. And so what that might look like is uh, dry erase boards that line two walls and within them, those contain storage that can pop out. And in one of the spaces, you pop out and you fold down a huge set of stairs. And now those stairs have all this different impact upon the room and upon the space and on what's going to happen in the interaction of the individuals, um, where the teacher can present from, where the students can just see the space differently by sitting on them. They can interact and have a, a small group activity. They can drop their little egg parachutes from different heights and uh, do their uh, science experiment. So thinking about giving teachers what they don't have, and, and that's going to be different for every teacher with some universal concepts. Okay. Um, uh, Carol Williams has a, has a question. I believe this isn't uh, in reference to the um, museum green learning environments that Marcel and Suzanne were speaking about. Um, what kind of um, public slash private collaboration will be necessary to create um, these uh, potentially uh, these hugely potential laden environments, such as the um, the project that you showed? Learn how to unmute. Oh. <laughs> After all, it's only been one and a half years now. <laughs> We're still new. <laughs> we, we, are, we, are still, we are still new to it, aren't we? Um, well, public-private collaboration. That's a very good question because I would assume that the entire field of education is probably here a lot more a thing of the, the public sector. So of course you have you have parents and families who are engaged, but I guess it would be a lot more so in the United States, definitely. Now, if you want to create a space like, for example, in the science campus, that does not only cater to the scientists and the students and so on, but really to everybody, which should be inviting to everybody. So you would have to find a way to really connect to the local, to local communities. Now, if you say local communities and you are really in the heart of Berlin, then it's very difficult to, to, to talk, about, talk about a local community. Think of communities in downtown Manhattan or, or in the city of London or so with a, a huge fluctuation of, of people relatively few people live really mm -hmm. adjacent to it. There are some, but not, not many, usually in tiny, tiny apartments, which are like mere cupboards. Mm -hmm. And so it's not where families with lots of children live, definitely not. Um, so I assume one way it would be really doing larger surveys in the, in the population 
what what is of interest to you i would probably interact if i had to design this or collect data mm -hmm. um, i would probably interact with the schools well that is not really strictly public private uh, because most of the schools are public as well but you have certainly an expert group the teachers who know about learning process and who know about the value of, of places like that. So that is probably one start. Do you have any other yeah, ideas on that? It's, I think it's all about communication and listening to each other. And before you start the design that you collect as many experiences by the future users of the space. Mm. I think this is, um, I think the most important thing because the, it's as Jane put with all these images of construction sites. Once you have this construction site, it goes on. So you have to find most of these uh, um, solutions and ideas before you pour the concrete. <laughs> so you have to talk to the people before and listen to them. And uh, I think this is um, something, what we have from Berlin are quite uh, some initiatives, for example, on this former Tempelhof mm. uh, airfield. There's an initiative of urban gardening and it's a beautiful garden and uh, the administration mm. of uh, the borough of Neukölln, I think they only gave the permit that people could start something on a special site. And then the people did it themselves. You know, this is sort of, uh, it, it's a great place to go there. And there's some similar gardens initiative, public gardens in, in Kreuzberg area. So I think this is something you can yeah. maybe translate to a campus site on a university to tell the students, you are the ones, you, you're not living there, but you are spending there an important time of your life. So you are in charge of the gardening or the lobby or let's even say the, the, the kind of cleanness of the building. Mm. Don't do graffiti. <laughs> Don't think, throw things away. Just think it's your home, even if it's not the place where you live. But keep it uh, in a good condition and then suddenly things get more... Uh, more meaning. Actually, we do have a little example of that because our division had or, or still has a really a relatively small garden plot right behind the museum. And mm. that was a, a project where students who wanted to do a little bit of gardening themselves, they could get a small plot not much, but just, just to collect, to plant a few um, species, a few plants that they like, whether it's vegetable or just something crazy they'd seen some and they wanted to try it out. And that worked beautifully because that spot, which was formerly really an abandoned place, it still had gravel fr from it, from, from destroyed buildings from the war. And, and so it was not a, a used place, but once we, we offered it to, to students to use it. They, they planted all sorts of herbs and, and vegetables and things. And it became, it became also a place where the people working at the museum went for their lunch break, sitting in that garden. So once you get it started, and if you manage to keep that momentum going, then something really beautiful grows out of it. And I assume, that we could maybe transfer that energy, mm -hmm. very similar to the energy in, of, the, of the urban gardens into such a place shared by science and by, by the public. I wondered, Sarah, about your um, installations and projects that you have done, if the stories that those communities would tell, could tell, will tell, would inspire other communities who don't know what they don't have, right? It's, uh, so is that a way using your real life experience and the successes that have been realized by the uh, installations, by the projects that you've done across many different um, cultures and communities, 
would that inspire, do you think, uh, the public-private partnerships potential for, well, I want that in my community. What do we need to do in my, what do I need to do to make sure we get that in my community kind of thing? Is that, yes. do you see that happening? Yes, absolutely. And I think part of that is is the role that we play because we can be a megaphone for communities to, you know, to, to go around and, and, you know, work with our network to say, you know, this is what we did over here. This is what we've done over here and really, you know, showcase the full range of projects. Um, that said, you know, I think that, you know, in my dream world someday, um, we rely much Less, I mean, granted, my you know the the projects that we do are not quite to the scale of the ones that Suzanne and Marcel are talking about, but but you know, in thinking about how you integrate playful learning and those opportunities into everything that we do, and so yes, of course, into schools and school buildings, but also into the bus stops, into the sidewalks, into the public housing that we're building. I mean, in an ideal world, I would love to see that you know if you're going to build. Um, or bid on this this new you know public housing site. Um, your your plan better include some playful learning, right? And that that is one of the re- requirements that is baked into that because we know that it's just it's so much more cost effective if you do it at the beginning. It can be these little tweaks that you make to the, that to the design that really have that great impact. And so you know it, in my dream world that becomes you know really baked into that process from the beginning um, in a way that is you know reinforced by um, by communities. And governments that that award these kinds of projects and these bids. Um, and, you know, also, I think from, from the you know, architect's standpoint, um, you know, we have the data to support why that's an ad for, for your bid. So, um, you know, happy to support that. And we have supported bids like that in New York City recently, for example, um, on a public housing unit and, and things of that nature. So I, in my world, that's, that's where I would love to go with this. Um. Question from uh, Adam Quigley. Uh, there's a short documentary. Uh, before I get to that, two more questions, panelists. So uh, <laughs> um, bear with me. Uh, okay, Adam Quigley. Uh, there's a short documentary called The Land that documents a UK adventure playground that encourages self directed, unstructured, risky play. Uh, this is an extreme example, but more often the More often than not, playgrounds are very prescriptive and designed more for safety than for fun and imagination. Uh, Any thoughts on play spaces that promote creativity? Uh, David, uh, do you wanna start us off? Yeah, actually, I think I've come across that playground that they're referenced in. And uh, if I have it correctly, there were uh, like power tools available and and hammers and nails and and all (laughs) kinds of stuff going on there. So um, yes, an extreme example, but point taken. And I think, um, you know, I hate to say it, but uh, it's just partially the American um, sue culture. So you're gonna get sued if you have a playground that's a little too risky. And and so people pass the buck onto the manufacturers uh, with that regard. And so then they are gonna buy a very uh, safe playground from a specific manufacturer who's going to then uh, only offer the warranty on that when they do the installation and the installation is you know, three times the cost of the actual materials and so yeah that's a problem and I think um, I don't have an answer on that solution except for uh, installations like Sarah's or, or more creative designs that might be coming out through this think tank that are more about uh, the interest in uh, manipulating topography or the interest in in having um, a pile of rocks or the interest in having different things that are more cost effective, that are interesting and educational, um, thinking about park space in terms of all of its different use. And so yes, the playground uh, will be one aspect of that. I absolutely love the slides that Susan Marshall were sharing about the lit um, space. So how the buildings were lit and how that might provide a different light for a playground rather than an overhead light. I thought that was genius and something I'll definitely try to uh, incorporate in future designs that we work on. Um, so yeah, in a nutshell, I think it's, it's a big problem that I think play does need to be a little bit riskier in the United States, that's a tough balance. If I can just add in here quickly, um, I 
would also vote for, uh, you know, supervised and controlled risky play. It doesn't have to be quite extreme, though I will say that my favorite children's museum in the Seattle area has power tools out for kids to use. Um, they are supervised while doing it, but it is, kids love it and adults are a little freaked out at first, but they see that kids can actually handle it. And I think it's a really great way that kids learn what their boundaries are and can start to push against that. Um, I know we're running out of time, so I will just say that if you visit the Playful Learning Landscapes webpage, we have a playbook on there. One of the things that we design around are six C's learning goals, and one of our six C's is creative innovation. Um, and I will say only one of our C's is content. <laughs> so everything else is sort of getting at all these other skills like collaboration, communication, creative innovation, critical thinking, uh, confidence. Um, and so, so there's lots of ideas for designing around creative innovation because that that is certainly you know, one of the things that we have identified as a 21st century skill. Um, so more information on our website. Just a small thing, a little example for a, a playground that is maybe a little bit more risky. Um, there, there was Berlin and had the, the International Garden Exhibition in 2017. And on this exhibition or fair if you want to call it like that it's a big garden space and then they had a playground which was a nature playground and it was designed so that the kids could kind of crawl under hedges and between shrubs and trees and they were all made in a way that adults wouldn't fit in and couldn't follow them in well of course in an emergency you probably could but so that was kind of a semi-wild space where they would maybe find sticks and rocks and all sort of things you need to play. And so that was very successful and very popular with the children. Well, I had to, uh, I smiled when this uh, question came because I know so many whiskey playgrounds in Berlin. Just, just think about all these uh, for, what are these uh, swimming pool, public swimming pools, which get a bit old and are not in no really good maintenance, mm. as uh, Berlin is not a rich city concerning the, our administration. And if you see all these kids, including my daughter, are jumping from the five meter springboard or even 10 meter springboard, I think I had so many heart attacks. <laughs> <laughs> But in the end, I think it's it's something was Dane explained this. I think it's for kids to experience the body and to play and yeah. what they can and to somehow uh, uh, stretch the limits of what they can do. So um, I think there are actually in Berlin, I know lots of risky places. <laughs> so uh, they are still open. You can just go there. It's um, um, David, so if you ever come to Berlin with your kids, <laughs> be careful. <laughs> uh, and, and Ross, just to jump in again, a quick two-line plug for Montessori education. Uh, their philosophy on their playgrounds is if you can, you can. So if you can climb on top of the playground, on top of the monkey bars, on top of the swing set, whatever, you can. Great. Um, okay. Uh, well, thank you for... Uh, thank you to all our panelists for uh, for attending today. Um, uh, thank you, Jane, for being our, our keynote speaker. You're welcome. Um, uh, I'd like to remind everyone that uh, you will receive AIA continuing education credits for attending today's conference. Uh, you must email uh, jbanda at leggett.com uh, with your AIA number, your name and AIA number to receive uh, the credits. Um, you will be, uh, all attendees will be receiving a uh, uh, post event packet uh, within the next week uh, or so that will include the panelists suggestions uh, for further reading, uh, as well as ways to get in, uh, in touch with panelists. Um, we are also running a uh, competition uh, to complement this year's think tank, uh, Equalizing Everywhere. Um, there it is, Equalizing Everywhere, uh, the Global Playground. Um, this is an ideas competition for designing the future of playful learning in communities around the world. Uh, for more information, um, please see the link uh, that has been, that will be posted in the chat. Um, 
registration is currently open and winners will be announced on November 12th. Um, this is the uh, reminder that this is the first of four Think Tank events this fall. Uh, we have Think Tanks, uh, Think Tank events on October 1st, October 22nd, and November 12th, uh, focusing on public housing uh, and multifamily projects, transit and retail infrastructure, and design for health and well being, respectfully, uh, respectively, and respectfully. Uh, this is the first, and this is the first four Think Tank events. So, um, the next uh, think tank event is October 1st um, from 2 to 5 p.m. Uh, uh, Central Time. Uh, link to register will be in the chat also. Um, and that event will be hosted by Adam Quigley. Uh, thanks again to uh, our panelists. Thank you, Marcel. Thank you, uh, Suzanne. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you, Sarah. and. Thank you, uh, Jane Leach. All right. Thank you, uh, everyone. Um, before uh, before you guys go, uh, do um, we'll start with Marcel because you're the first one up. Um, you're the first one on my Zoom window. Uh, where can uh, we find more information about agriculture? And you can plug your social media if you'd like. Well, I'm not using social media that much. I must admit. Um, we, we do have some information on the an agriculture open project. An open home world. Yes, there is a, there was an event called the Open Humboldt Festival, which if you just put this into Google, it will probably get you straight away there. And that was sort of a summer event, outdoors, COVID um, conforming. And we had a presentation there, so which tell, will tell a little bit about the, the agritecture project and other than that well watch the space there is more mm -hmm. to come we have the site but we have to build up the website ah, well, we, we have the address so far. yes that is right that is right we have a, a web a website but it doesn't have much content in <laughs> as as yet i think it's just called agritecture.com i think so dot org um so we are it's, it's still work in progress um, and it is not only work that happens in the, in the classes, but also a series of masters and bachelor's thesis that we um, supervise together. Mm -hmm. So there is definitely more to come and building up bit by bit. Uh, Suzanne, any, uh, any closing thoughts, anything you'd like to uh, plug? I think it's a great opportunity that you invited us to this panel and I think it's so great to sit here and well it's now pitch black outside we're from midnight and we're still talking to you in the US it's it's great I think this is one of these fantastic experiences with with zoom <laughs> so that we can talk to each other without sitting in a plane and having long well, it's, although well, my daughter is at the moment in California and I'm really longing to go to and visit her. And I do hope this pandemic will get over really soon. Mm -hmm. And I'd, I'd like to come and see you in person. Yeah, <laughs> that'd be great. Mm -hmm. um, David, um, thank you for, thank you. Oh, well, thank you, Marcel and Suzanne again for attending. David, um, where can we find more about the well and uh, Global play Playground? Well, I don't anticipate a lot of people rushing to the website of a startup business. Uh, mm -hmm. It might be interesting for some, and uh, that's going to be at livethewell.com. And then we're on all the social medias. And, and one thing that might be interesting uh, for Jane to share with other uh, preschools in, um, in Columbus is our presence. We are uh, quite active on social media. So then on Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, you name it, it is the Well Madison WI. And uh, that's because that will pop up more frequently in a keyword search. So that's why we changed, <laughs> we changed it there. Uh, but no, just a pleasure to, to be on here and to meet all these wonderful people, um, to hear the passion come through in their voices. And uh, I took a lot of notes and I, I gained a lot of uh, valuable information uh, just from the short discussion. So 
Thank you to uh, Leggett Architects for organizing this, inviting me, and uh, for all the other panelists. It was a, a pleasure speaking with you. Uh, thank you again, uh, David. Um, Sarah, uh, any closing remarks? Uh, where can we find more about you? Sure. Uh, the best place is probably our website. I'll um, put it in the chat box, but it's playfullearninglandscapes.com. Um, and I referenced the playbook, which is uh, available as a downloadable file from that, uh, from our website. It includes um, all, you know, all the theory, all the research behind, you know, how we do what we do, as well as some, some template designs um, and, and some projects that we've done in the past. Um, stay tuned for more. The playbook is currently available in English and Spanish. Uh, we are about to add Portuguese and Chinese to that list um, based on some partnerships that we are working on right now. Um, we're also on Twitter, but um, I would say the website is probably the best place to find information. Sounds thank good. you again. Thank you. Thank you for attending. Uh, and uh, Jane Leach, uh, thank, you, thank you for being our, our keynote speaker once again. Um, where can we find more about Future Ready Columbus? Well, first, thank you for the opportunity. It's always <laughs> great to get out there and tell the story and learn of other people's stories. I have to say I was really more excited about the panel discussion because I was so <laughs> curious. I'd read all the bios and visited your website. So I'm like, oh, I got to learn. I got to hear, hear more. So thanks to the interesting panelists and to this great firm for bringing us together. The easiest way to get to Future Ready Columbus is to go to, it's pretty creative, futurereadycolumbus.org. And from there, you'll see the links to Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and I don't know, all those. It's all yeah. there. So please go to futureadycolumbus.org and we look forward to seeing you follow us and we'll be following you. And here's to making the world a better, kinder, gentler, healthier place. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Um, well, thank you to everyone that attended uh, today's event. And um, thank you to all those that provided questions for uh, Jane and the panelists. Uh, I'd like to take a moment to thank the think, thank the think tank team. Say that uh, five times back. Yeah, oh, I Here knew I was going to mess that up. <laughs> uh, Adam Quigley, uh, Sepeda Asadi, Nicholas Woodard, um, our think tank leadership of Ted Haug and Robin Randall, support from Jody Boyce, Anna McDonough. Douglas Agurek and Ann Tranter, our CEO, CEO Patrick Brosnan, and uh, our think tank coordinator, Justin Banda. So thank you to all those. And, uh, and yeah, that's it. Uh, have a great weekend. Thanks, you too. Take Bye. care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.